to order. The committee is meeting today to hear testimony on examining the history of federal lands and the development of tribal co-management. Under committee rule 4F, any oral opening statements at this hearing are limited to the chair and the ranking minority member or their designees. This will allow us to hear from the witnesses sooner and help members keep to their schedules. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members opening statements be made part of the record if they are submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or at the close of this hearing, uh, whichever comes first. Hearing no objections, so ordered. Uh, without objection, the chair also declares a recess subject to the call of the chair. Hearing no objection, so ordered. And described in the hearing notice, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at hnrcdocs at mail.house.gov. Additionally, please note, that as always, members are responsible for their own microphones. As with our in-person meetings, members must be muted, but members can only be muted by staff to avoid inadvertent background noise. Many member, uh, finally, members or witnesses experience technical problems should inform the committee staff immediately. Uh, I will now uh, recognize myself to make an opening statement. Uh, hello and welcome uh, to the House Natural Resources Committee hearing entitled examining, his, examining the History of Federal Lands and the Development of Tribal Co-Management. I appreciate uh, our committee members joining us today and hope that we'll have an insightful and productive hearing. Today's hearing is, is one that I believe is long overdue, both in, at the committee level and in Congress. Fundamentally, tribal co-management provides an opportunity for indigenous people to work alongside federal agencies to manage federal lands and resources. Indigenous perspectives are uniquely significant for cultural preservation and can improve management practices, particularly when coupled with indigenous traditional ecological knowledge. Through tribal co-management, we can lift the indigenous presence while continuing to meet our obligations to protect the climate and conserve federal lands. During uh, my time as chair of this committee has consistently worked to elevate the presence of tribal governments in federal decision-making process by strengthening tribal sovereignty and reaffirming tribal determination, self-determination. The expansion of tribal co-management on federal lands further builds on that essential work. But if we want to begin the conversation about tribal co-management meaningfully, first we must acknowledge and come to terms with the country's history. The European colonization of this continent and the founding of this country are built on the dispossession of land from indigenous peoples by force, coercion, or bad faith legal arrangements. Indigenous peoples, the original caretakers of these lands and resources were forcibly displaced. Congress must formally acknowledge that the lands we now know as the United States are, are the ancestral homelands of millions of indigenous peoples who, are, who were killed, removed, or relocated. It is equally important to acknowledge that while many tribes suffer, suffered and, and were exterminated through these acts, many tribes still persist and call these lands home today. As uncomfortable as it may be to hear this is our history, it must be considered honestly and respectfully. To that end, I plan to introduce a resolution formally acknowledging the federal disposition of these lands from indigenous communities and calling on the federal government to include tribal governments and indigenous traditional ecological knowledge on the management of these lands. I'm working with the Government Accountability Office to review how federal lands and management agencies uh, work with tribes regarding their ancestral lands. I'm working with soon to be introduced legislation with Senator Heinrich from New Mexico that would better protect tribal sacred sites. While the history of land dispossession and violence can never be fully re redressed, I believe that there are opportunities to bring tribal communities back into the management of their ancestral lands. In doing so, we can support indigenous communities while improving land management based on expertise developed since time in memorial. I'm encouraged by the Biden administration's renewal of the White House Tribal Nation Summit, which is focusing on protecting tribal sacred sites 
incorporating indigenous traditional ecological knowledge and engaging tribes in land management. I look forward to working with my colleagues in the administration and Congress to expand and incorporate indigenous knowledge and history in land and resource management across the country, especially in our public lands. I look, I look forward uh, to this conversation today and hope that the insights prov provided help develop a roadmap for significant expansion of tribal co-management. I want to make it clear today is a starting is a starting point in effort, and efforts to expand co-management must continue in the weeks, months, and years ahead. Before we turn to our panel, I want to, I would like to thank our witnesses uh, for their expert testimony and, and appreciate their, uh, their being with us today. I want to recognize the tribal leaders testifying, Lieutenant Governor uh, Carlton Bowatkoti uh, of, of the Pueblo of Zuni, and Chair Melvin Baker from Southern U. I also want to acknowledge that we are honored to have a historic administration witness, National Park Service Director Charles F. Sams. Director Sams is the first Senate confirmed park director in nearly five years and the first tribal citizen to lead the agency. He's an enrolled member of the Cayuse and Walla Walla of the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla Indian Reservation. So. Thank you all again for your participation today. I sincerely look forward to the conversation. I yield back and recognize uh, our ranking member, uh, Mr. Westerman, for his opening statement. Sir, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Uh, while the subject of today's hearing is important to me and, and many who are on this WebEx, uh, there's a subject that's being ignored that is far more important that we should all be discussing. We should be having hearings on this until we get to a resolution. And that is the unprecedented energy crisis that our country and the world is facing right now. This committee has jurisdiction over many of the, uh, the resources that could be used to solve this energy crisis. And I would consider it uh, a dereliction of duty to have a hearing and not to bring this up. And Mr. Chair, until we start working on this, we won't be quiet about it. It is an issue that needs to be addressed. The energy policy that this country has right now is not reliable, not reliable in the sense of technology. It's not reliable in where our energy is sourced from. It's not affordable. And it's certainly not clean or, or as clean as it could be if we were really serious about energy policy. This is affecting everyday Americans with prices at the pump at $4.10 a gallon and, and going up. Um, it's only starting. Uh, as we all know, energy is a component to the cost of everything. It's time to start planting crops in our country and the cost of fertilizer is directly linked to the cost of natural gas. So we're gonna see food prices go up and probably even food shortages uh, because of a lack of good energy policy. Uh, the administration should be talking to domestic producers and we should be facilitating that on how we increase production, uh, not uh, just banning oil and energy from Russia and then turning around and negotiating with countries like Iran and Venezuela to fill uh, in that gap. Uh, Contrary to, to claims about increases in renewable power and more electric cars on the road, this will not solve the energy crisis. Uh, we have seen the disastrous results of our European allies who have shut down their own supplies of reliable baseload power in an attempt to rapidly transition to renewables. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was in Germany back before I got into Congress when I was doing engineering work 10 years ago riding around with German engineers and them being critical of the political decisions that were being made to shut down their nuclear power plants. Uh, today, Germany is getting 44% of their power from uh, fossil fuels. Uh, they're supposed to be the, the uh, example to the world on how to do renewable energy, uh, but we see the bind that they're in right now and their dependence on, on Russia. Uh, we have to develop our domestic uh, energy resources, and this committee needs to be having hearings on this crisis and how increasing production on federal lands and waters can directly address the challenges we face. 
Um, this crisis is only going to get worse if we fail uh, to react. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the subject of today's hearing on tribal co-management. I think we can learn a lot uh, from tribes. As I've traveled around the country and met with tribes, and I've seen how they manage their federal or manage their land, it's in stark contrast to the way uh, our federal government manages lands. Uh, if if we would uh, work more closely with tribes, if we would truly uh, adhere to the Indian Self-Determination Education and Assistance Act, if we would uh, be more uh, aggressive with the uh, Tribal Force Protection Act, uh, then we would see not only better management on tribal lands, but we could learn from that on how we manage our federal lands. Uh, we're getting ready for another unprecedented fire season, and uh, we're to blame for that. We know what to do, but we're not doing it. We're continuing to tie up uh, management activities. Uh, fortunately, uh, we have tribes and state governments and private uh, landowners who are managing properly and they can show the way uh, that, that we need to manage. And I uh, also want to acknowledge two of our witnesses joining us here uh, from the Southern Ute Tribe and the Intertribal Timber Council, uh, who both support responsibly developing natural resources while also protecting the environment. Uh, there is a perspective here that I, as I said, I think we can all learn from, and I look forward to the testimony today, but Mr. Chairman, I request that uh, we start having hearings on uh, domestic energy production and how this committee can be proactive in getting more of our energy resources and not just energy, but um, but minerals and elements as well into the marketplace. Uh, I look forward to the discussion. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Weather, Mr. Man. I think uh, the the war in Ukraine and our dependence on oil and gas are both issues of great national concern. And uh, but we're here to recognize uh, the, this country history of disposition of tribal communities and, and to consider opportunities to, to, to expand tribal co-management of ancestral lands. Uh, no one, uh, I, I, I and I know my colleagues on my side of the aisle do, are not about avoiding uh, the conversation, sir. There is nothing to protect and any history to look at, and particularly uh, the previous four years of the previous administration in terms of policies in this direction. But we can go forward and, and I'll be glad to uh, uh, have uh, our mutual staffs talk about that and, and, and structure something that is uh, both informative and, uh, and just doesn't have, and just doesn't deal with the uh, gas and oil industry's talking points, which seems to be to use the crisis of Ukraine in a very shameless way to try to push a whole a, a drilling wholly only uh, uh, agenda for our federal lands. I think that merits discussion and uh, be, and uh, look forward to see if we can structure that. With that, let me now uh, uh, we we can begin with the uh, with the testimony of our witnesses. Let me remind the witnesses uh, that under our committee rules, they may limit their oral statements to five minutes and that their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. When you begin, the timer will start, it will turn orange when you have one minute left and red when your time has expired. I recommend, I recommend that members and witnesses join remotely using the grid view so that they may lock their timer onto the screen. Uh, after your testimony is over, please mute yourself so that we don't have any background noise and it will allow the entire panel to testify before we begin questioning the witnesses. Let me begin uh, with the testimony from Honorable Charles F. Sams, Director of the National Park Service. Director Sams, you're invited to share your testimony. Sir, you're recognized. My name is Stephen Anuma, and Ashwanasha Chuck Sams, National Park Service Director. Good morning, Chairman Grahava and Ranking Member Westerman and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss tribal co-management of federal lands. I would like to submit our full statement for the record and summarize the department's views. I am the first tribally enrolled member to lead the National Park Service. I come from the Umatilla Indian Reservation in Oregon, where I am Cayuse and Walla Walla with blood ties to the Kokopa and Yankton Sioux. I share the Biden-Harris administration's commitment to strengthening the role of Native American tribes 
Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiian organizations, and will focus my comments today on cooperative stewardship of our national parks. Last November, Secretary Holland and Secretary of Agriculture Vilsack issued a joint secretarial order on fulfilling the trust responsibility to Indian tribes in the stewardship of federal lands and waters. This secretary's order recognizes that federal lands were previously owned and managed by Indian tribes, contain cultural and natural resources of significance to tribes, and are sometimes in areas where tribes have reserved rights to hunt, fish, gather, and prey, pursuant to treaties and agreements with the United States. The secretary's order also directs agencies to increase opportunities for tribes to participate in their traditional stewardship of present day federal lands and the integration of indigenous knowledge into federal management. As director of the National Park Service, I'm committed to increasing co-stewardship with tribes in the interest of all peoples of the United States. The co-stewardship of parks by the NPS and tribes takes many forms, including co-management obligations in law, collaboration and cooperative agreements and self-governance agreements. Currently, Four parks in the national park system have co-management authority with tribes. Canyon de Chelly National Monument, which is located within the Navajo Nation in Arizona, Glacier Bay National Park and Preserve in Southeast Alaska, Grand Portage National Monument, which is located within the Grand Portage Indian Reservation in Minnesota, and Big Cypress National Preserve in Florida, which I was very fortunate enough to visit a couple weeks ago. One example of co-management is the traditional harvest of all eggs by the Hunaklinka in Glacier Bay National Park, a practice that has ensured intergenerational transmission of ancestral traditions and strengthens the Hunaklinka ties to their homeland. Another example is the co-management of the Grand Portage National Monument by the NPS and the Grand Portage Band of Chippewa Indians. The project in the park and on the reservation includes preservation of historic structures, ethnobotanical restoration, wildland fire activities, and archaeological surveys. Most NPS working relationships with tribal nations are collaborative or cooperative opportunities. To highlight just two examples, the Nisqually tribe is currently collaborating with Mount Rainier National Park to publish a report on traditionally harvest plants with recommendations for gathering, conducting gathering in a sustainable manner. At Acadia National Park, a multi-year project with the Babanaki Nation of Maine centers on traditional gathering of sweet grass within the park. This project incorporates centuries of traditional ecological knowledge, as well as cultural protocols to assert indigenous sovereignty in natural and cultural resource management on ancestral lands. The NPS also negotiates with self-governance tribes for annual funding agreements, or AFAs, as authorized under the Indian Self-Determination Education and Assistance Act. Federally recognized tribes that are traditionally associated with a park may carry out services such as research, fire protection, interpretation, and educational programming and maintenance functions. Since the NPS began entering into AFAs with self-governance tribes, tribal communities have received over $38 million. To highlight one example, the Yurok tribe has an AFA at Redwood National and State Parks. The Yurok Youth Trail Corps will assist the park with performing repairs on the California Coastal Trail. The crew will also participate in resource stewardship education opportunities, gain exposure in various resource management operations, and receive orientation to career opportunities within the park system. Finally, some tribes have specific kinds of statutory authority related to national parks. For example, the Nez Perce tribe owns and operates 29 of the sites that comprise Nez Perce National Historic Park. While the NPS owns and manages the other nine sites, the park is authorized in its enabling legislation to cooperate with the Nez Perce tribe through research and to provide interpretive services. Although the NPS has entered into a number of co-management, cooperative, collaborative, and self-governance agreements, we still have many opportunities to expand the use and scope of these agreements with interested tribes pursuant to Secretary's Order 3403. With the dedicated professionals of the NPS, I look forward to continuing to engage, collaborate, and enter agreements with tribes. Chairman Grahala, Ranking Member Westland, thank you for inviting me to testify before you today. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you or other members of the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you, Director Sams. Much appreciated. And let me now uh, turn to the Honorable Carlton Carlton Boakoti, uh, Lieutenant Governor of the Pueblo of Zuni and Co-Chair of the Big Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition. Lieutenant Governor, you are welcome and you're invited to share your testimony. You're recognized. <clears throat> Hello, Kwan. 
Chairman Grialva, Ranking Member Westerman, and respected members of the committee, I am Carlton Bawakati, the Lieutenant Governor of the Pueblos of the Zuni Tribe and the Co-Chair of the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition. On behalf of the people of the Zuni Tribe, with support from the coalition, namely the Hopi Tribe, the Mount Yu Tribe, Navajo Nation, and Yu Indian Tribe, I want to thank you for inviting me to speak on the topic of tribal co-management this morning. To begin, I would like to respectfully ask the committee to contemplate how far the arch of Indian relations has bent from the inhumane policies of Indian removal, bounties for Indian scalps, and the painful legacies of boarding schools and criminalization of our language and culture. From more recent policies that really began with the Nixon administration, the arch is now bending in a direction that is very different. Now, remarkably, presidents and members of Congress like you are acknowledging that our centuries of experience living and perpetuating the environment around us, developing what some people call traditional eco ecological knowledge, is an important resource not something to be ignored, but instead to incorporate in a collaborative effort to take care for our public lands. Our present day lands are comprised of approximately 600,000 acres in Western New Mexico and Eastern Arizona. However, our Aboriginal lands, as well as those of our 18 sister pueblos in New Mexico and the five tribes that comprise our coalition, include the lands that comprise the Bears Ears National Monument. The lands within Bears Ears are part of our history and culture, and even today they play an integral role in our traditions and religious ceremonies. It, along with the neighboring Grand Staircase uh, Escalante to the east and Mesa Verde to the west, is part of the Colorado Plateau, the region where our Zuni ancestors lived before migrating southward into present-day New Mexico. Zuni has been actively involved in the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition since its inception. It is a unique coalition, one that has remained focused on our mutual interest in ensuring that the unique cultural and natural resources found on these ancestral tribal lands are protected and preserved. Zuni recognizes that while the Bears Ears lands, though once controlled and ex used exclusively by the tribes in the Southwest, are now federal lands owned by all Americans. However, the uni unique historical and cultural ties that Southwestern tribes have to Bears Ears must also be recognized and given meaningful voice. Today, instead of being removed from a landscape to make way for a public park, we are being invited back to our ancestral homelands to help prepare them and plan for the resilient future. We are being asked to apply our traditional knowledge to both the natural and human caused ecological challenges, drought, erosion, visitation, et cetera, that are growing. What could be a better avenue of restorative justice than giving tribes the opportunity to participate in the management of lands their ancestors were removed from? Tribal co-management of our nation's public lands also offers our youth the opportunity to learn about public land management. Tribal co-management provides us the means to fulfill our obligations to the land, to our ancestors, and to our children and grandchildren. With specific regard to Bears Ears, Zuni, along with the other four tribes that comprise the Bears Ears Commission, are eager to work with the Bureau of Land Management and Forest Service to create a management plan for the monument that we will hope will ensure that its unique landscape and cultural resources can be seen and experienced. I believe that collaborative problem solving and candid but respectful exchanges of perspective will be crucial to co-management. We realize that the Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Forest Service have developed their own policies and approaches to land and resource management generally reflecting the Western point of view. As a coalition, we are developing and finalizing a land management plan that is based on and reflects upon our collective traditional ecological knowledge. We hope that this tribal-led combined land management plan will be given careful consideration by the federal land management agencies and will be incorporated into the Bears Ears Monument Management Plan and general planning process. We also hope that the federal government will provide us with the financial resources to carry on our work as co-managers. As Dean Washburn recently noted in his University of Iowa article, through mechanisms like 638 contracts and cooperative agreements, federal agencies can facilitate meaningful tribal participation in the management of public lands. We are enormously grateful to President Biden for restoring the boundaries of the Bears Ears National Monument, and it is time we begin the hard work of managing Bears Ears and doing so in a manner that we can all be proud of. Eloko for your time today. I'm here because our people care enormously about the Bears Ears National Monument and stand united with the Bears Ears Coalition, the Hopi Tribe, Ute Mount Ute Tribe, Navajo Nation, and Ute Indian Ute Tribe. We, along with our sister fellows in New Mexico's and tribes throughout our country, express our appreciation for this dialogue and thank you for bringing this important topic up for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Governor and let me now uh, recognize Chairman Melvin. Baker of the Southern Youth Tribal Council. Chairman Baker, you are welcome and invited to uh, share your testimony, sir. You're recognized. Good morning. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for allowing to do this testimony. 
Good morning, Chairman Gohalva, Ranking Member Westerman, and members of the committee. My name is Melvin J. Baker. I am the elected chairman of the Southern New Indian Tribal Council, the governing body of the Southern New Indian Tribe. Thank you for the invitation to speak to you today regarding tribal participation in the management of areas of cultural significance and the opportunity to acquire public lands that may benefit tribes. The Southern New Indian Tribe has extensive experience working with our federal and state public lands or um, has extensive experience working with our federal and state partners in the maintenance and management of lands in which we have a mutual interest. We believe that experience will benefit the committee. By way of background, the Southern New Indian Reservation consists of approximately 700,000 acres of land located in southwestern Colorado. Approximately 311,000 surface acres of that land is held in trust by the federal government to benefit the tribe. The reservation is checkerboarded with federal and state governments as well as private landowners holding interest in reservation land. The tribe with just under 1,500 members is a leader in Indian country with a demonstrated and sterling record of forest site and business acumen. The tribe is the only Indian tribe in the nation with a AAA credit rating, which is earned through years of steady governance and successful and prudent business transactions. However, like many reservations today, the Southern Indian Reservation was once much larger. The youths were forced off their original treaty protected lands to their present reservation. In 1874, Congress approved an agreement between the United States and the Ute Indians in Colorado, and known as the Brunot Agreement of September 13, 1873. Pursuant to the Brunot Agreement, the Utes were forced to cede certain lands of the United States, but reserved a right to hunt, fish, and gather on that land. This land, which consists of 3.7 million acres, <coughs> Um, this land, which consists of 3.7 million acres on which this present day Southern Ute and Ute Mountain tribes are reserved their rights, has come to be known as a Brunot area. While these off reservation rights were protected by federal treaty, history shows that federal government often did not honor those rights. Today, over 27% of the lands over which the tribes could exercise their reserved rights have, in effect, been lost. Many of those lands currently are under control of the federal and state agencies, municipalities, and private landowners. Yet, even today, almost 150 years after the Brunot Agreement, and despite the Supreme Court's continuing recognition of the enforceability of tribal treaties, the Sunni Indian tribe faces a constant battle to protect its treaty-protected lands. We frequently encounter proposed land swaps where the federal government considers exchanging federally owned land for, and held in, by private landowners or state and municipal governments. At times, the land the federal government wants to transfer is within the Brunei area, and the tribe must intervene to protect its treaty rights, an expensive and time-consuming endeavor. The Sunni Indian tribe is well known and respected for its expertise and exercise in its self-determination in managing its natural resources, including its energy interests. However, it also has a long history of coordinating with the federal, state, and local governments in the management of the land and cultural resources in which governmental interests may overlap. This is particularly essential in a checkerboard reservation like the Southern Utes where the governmental interests must coexist. A prime example is that in September 2008, the Southern Ute Indian Chime executed a memorandum of understanding with the state of Colorado so that they could be cooperatively managed the wildlife resources in the Bruna area. Under that managed under that memorandum, the tribe and the tribe and the state agreed to develop, adopt, and enforce basic regulations, including opening and Closure dates by species designated in hunting area units, bag and possession limits, fire and firearm requirements, and other general requirements deemed necessary for the management and harvest of game species. Moreover, the identified civil and criminal jurisdiction over violations is allocated. This memorandum ensures on a cooperative basis of how wildlife resources are preserved and protected in both tribal and non-tribal purposes. Similarly, the Southern Indian tribe has designated um, has been designated for treatment as a state status by the EPA with respect to regulation of air quality on the reservation. In order to receive that designation, an intergovernmental agreement was entered into by the, inter, inter, into by the tribe and the state for the cooperative development of air quality standards, rules, and regulations on the reservation. Once again, with an allocation for civil criminal jurisdiction based on that government to government relationship. The key aspects to the effectiveness of those agreements as placing tribes on an equal footing on with other governmental interests in the ownership and management of these lands and cultural resources. The Department of Interior has emphasized that the tribes must be participants in the management of their resources. We agree that with this position, it is essential that the tribes have not only have a voice in the management of their cultural resources on federal lands, but actually have an opportunity to administer them on the Southern Ute land. 
Um, we thank you um, for that testimony we're allowed to give today. If you have any questions, we'd be more than welcome to try to answer those. And also for all of you, if you're ever in our area, please stop by and visit our land. I mean, uh, my background is way of, uh, I used to be a former firefighter, so I understand a lot of this testimony, the land, the resources, and what we could do better to make our own tribal lands better working and cooperating with our local agencies, the BIA, the forestry. I mean, working together, we can accomplish a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, your testimony is appreciated, and I want to thank all, all the witnesses for their valuable testimony and reminding our members that uh, committee rule imposes a five-minute limit on questions. The chair will recognize members for any questions they may wish to ask uh, these witnesses. Let me uh, let me let me start by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, Director Sams. Uh, I mentioned earlier, this is one of the first times we've discussed uh, tribal uh, co-management co uh, in Congress. Uh, with that said, what legislative authorities can Congress use to assist and facilitate tribal co-management relationships going forward? And uh, what current funding streams are available at the Department of Interior to support uh, initiatives around tribal co-management? opportunities. Uh, Director? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Executive Order 13175 really provides us uh, the consultation and coordination with Indian tribes uh, and being able to co-manage these lands. Congress uh, and, and under NPS, Cooperative Management Agreement Authority found under 54 U.S.C. 101 703 grants the Secretary the authority to enter into agreements with state and local governments to acquire goods and services in order to create a more effective and efficient delivery service. National parks across the country have used this authority to enter into agreements to provide a variety of services from snowplow operations to transit. An expanded cooperative management agreement authority to include tribes could yield substantial benefits for both the National Park Service and the tribal part our tribal partners. As far as funding streams, on the federal side, traditional NPS funding sources are available to engage with tribes on a co-management opportunities and self-governance annual funding agreements. State, tribal, and local planning grants are available for the tribes through the Historic Preservation Fund, which supports the work of TIPOs through competitive and non-competitive grant programs. There is currently 203 TIPOs. The fiscal year 22 budget has requested an additional $10 million to fund these offices through non-competitive grants. The tribal heritage grants are competitive and available to federally recognized tribes, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiian organizations. These grants have been used for such things as protection of indigenous language, oral histories, plant animal species, important that are important to tradition and sacred and to sacred and historic places. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lieutenant Governor. Uh, I have some questions, but let me ask you if you may, and I, if I may, during these yes. times that we're in, during the times that we're in right now, Lieutenant Governor, you, uh, and, and you kind of caught a hint of the debate. It is, you know, less uh, in terms of the debate that's going to happen around energy policy, and particularly. Uh, being driven by what, what is going on at, in, in that horrible aggression by Putin in, in, in Ukraine and the consequences to those people. And that all that now forces, a, that that now creates a situation where uh, the value is the extraction, uh, that becomes the primary value. Uh, let me ask you about value uh, when we talk about uh, the struggle around when we talk about cultural sacred sites, cultural preservation, and the topic today uh, relative to the issue of co-management and the role of uh, defining uh, that trust responsibility even sharper for the federal government. Uh, talk about value, if you don't mind. I mean, the value of, that we see that's going to be promoted, that is uh, the resource is the extraction. It's what we can get out of it versus um, some of the discussions, even around Bears Ears and uh, other uh, struggles, have been around the issue of 
of preservation, sacred sites, cultural resources. If, if you don't mind, Lieutenant Governor, talking a little bit about that. Uh, Chairman, thank you for that question. Uh, and I guess we're speaking to renewable energy versus extractive industries, uh, speaking with our cultural leaders, we are supportive of those renewable energies and we understand um, in modern world, um, our foreign interest in, in this energy policy, my reflection of that, I'm a veteran of the Iraqi wars, did their deployments to Iraq and looking at it, what is our investment return on that situation? If we committed those resources and that time and effort into securing some of these agreements, where is that reflection now? So when I look back on that intensive effort and seeing the, the impact it had to the Iraqi landscape, I come back to my own um, reservation and see some of those same policies affecting that. When we see drought throughout the, and right now we don't even know if it's called a mega drought. We have to find a new definition for what's occurring in the Southwest here. Yep. When, we look at, when we look at certain, um, the Colorado River, uh, historic lows, how is that gonna affect the entire um, landscape throughout the Southwest when many of those and people envisioned that there will be snow packs or, or no changes to climate uh, climate change. And so when we look at the reflection of conservation and protection of water, those are the things that we're trying to protect. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, yield back, uh, Ms. Uh, Ranking Member Westerman, sir, you're recognized for your questions, comments. Thanks, Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses. Uh, Chairman Baker, tribes like the Southern uh, youth have proven to be excellent stewards of natural resources. Uh, as we think about the unprecedented spikes in energy uh, costs due to the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, and we know that there are massive reserves of, uh, uh, of untapped energy on tribal lands, do you think that we should be trying to get more oil and gas from hostile nations like Iran or Venezuela or from tribes like your own? Well, I believe that if the tribes uh, have it within their reservation homelands, it's definitely an opportunity. Um, we are very advanced in the oil and gas, but of course we do cater to mother nature, the land, all that. And we have to do things respectfully. Some of our rules and regulations surpass even federal government's um, rules and regulations. So I think working together and we always have other <clears throat> native tribes that come and visit with us for a one on one. And how do you do this? Uh, with new technology like horizontal drilling, it really changes the, the footprint of, uh, you don't see lands that are totally destroyed. It's all underground, horizontally drilling. Um, drilling. And there's a lot of new technology and we continue to work, but we do support domestic uh, production in Indian country. I mean, if we have the resources, we, we should, and I think it could really benefit some of the tribes that are not doing that. Um, but again, we have the expertise to even work with tribes and that's why they come and talk with us. So we're always willing to meet with them or anyone that wants to come out and see what we have put together. Thank you, Chairman. And, uh, you know, we're all concerned about being good stewards of the environment. As you mentioned, you all uh, are, are good stewards of your resources. And we know that the natural gas that we produce here in the United States is 40% cleaner than uh, the gas that Putin produces. Uh, if folks are really concerned about the environment, do you think that cutting off production on federal lands so that we can source more energy from hostile nations is the right move? Or should we be uh, using uh, the energy that you produce? And could you talk about some of the, uh, the hurdles that you, uh, you face and the, the environmental uh, sideboards that go into producing energy on tribal lands? Um, I definitely would not support, you know, utilizing, um, as you said, hostile or other um, countries oil when we can do it right here in our own country using more advanced uh, uh, what you say, economical as well as, you know, protecting the land. You know, again, we're at a good point where we're at, but we can do better. We all can do better. But a lot of times it's all about the federal funding, what it costs to do that. And I think uh, here in the United States, working together, sharing that technology, uh, cleaner energy, everything that goes with it, it's definitely, it can be done. And I support if we can move forward in that direction, working with anyone who wants to work with us. But uh, as I mentioned, a lot of times, it's all about the funding. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know that uh, tribes had to, had to lobby 
uh, for an exemption from the Biden administration's ban on U.S. oil and gas leasing. And fortunately, you were successful uh, in that. Uh, how devastating would it have been for your tribe had you had oil and gas production banned? Um, honestly, I don't think we would be where we're at today. You know, when it started in the early 80s and our leadership that uh, took on those tasks and where we are today is a major, we're a major player in that. But again, if we did not go that route, we would not be where we are today and continuing to uh, be um, helping our membership, helping our reservation, helping others, you know, what, what we can. But again, we always could use assistance uh, doing what we need to do and helping everybody else, helping our neighbors as well. Um, this is, um, you know, we have a, a resource development that allows us to provide education and health care for our membership. There's some of the things that we pay for ourselves that we can help. And that's because of what we've done. If we would have done it wrong, we wouldn't be where we are today. And again, our forefathers built that foundation. It's up to us today to continue and do even better and still keeping uh, clean energy in mind for the future. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, you know, if we're going to ban Russian energy, I would hope that we would produce more from tribal lands and from our federal lands and do it in a, a clean and sustainable way. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Let me uh, turn to uh, uh, Representative Huffman. Mr. Chairman, you're recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, boy, the false cho choices are flying from our Republican colleagues this morning. Uh, do we respond to Putin by um, cutting dirty oil deals with Iran and Venezuela, or do we develop oil and gas on tribal lands? Uh, our gas is cleaner than Putin's gas. I mean, our Republican colleagues just keep inviting us to pick our favorite Menendez brother or pick the prettiest horse at the glue factory. These are false choices, folks. There is a third way. We'll keep saying it, and I hope maybe uh, it gets through, but it's called clean energy. It changes the whole paradigm. And in a decarbonized world, you don't have to pick the prettiest horse at the glue factory. You can actually have clean energy, which makes thugs like Vladimir Putin powerless and poor, and pretty soon it'll make Russia uh, look for a new leader. But today's hearing uh, is about an important subject, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad that you're focusing us on uh, tribal co-management with our public lands. It's a big deal. In my district, indigenous culture is very important. I've got dozens of federally recognized tribes, in fact, more than any other congressional district in the lower 48. And uh, indigenous people we know have lived on these lands since time immemorial. They have incredible ecological knowledge and insights. This is not just something we say, it's actually proven by the science. Uh, in May 2019, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services uh, released a landmark report about the decline of nature globally uh, and the rise of extinctions. And this report found that three quarters of the terrestrial environment and about two thirds of the marine environment have been significantly altered by human activities. But on average, these trends have been less severe or even avoided in areas managed by indigenous people. So this is data that should not be ignored. The Biden administration has taken some good steps, uh, recognizing this important link by creating an interagency working group on indigenous traditional ecological knowledge. The administration's America the Beautiful initiative uh, outlines how we can achieve uh, conservation of 30% of lands and waters by 2030. Uh, and that includes not just uh, public and private lands, but also tribal lands and waters. So uh, I appreciate all that. And as chairman of the Water, Oceans and Wildlife Subcommittee, I'm especially interested in how this can help coastal communities thrive. So uh, I want to start with Ms. Dakota. Uh, thank you for your important work conserving salmon. Um, I understand that um, this is not only a subsistence uh, resource for you, but also cultural. And as you've discussed, uh, tribal governments have very unique ecological insights. Can you speak to some of the challenges tribal governments experience uh, under the current consultation system? Oh, I'm sorry. I one moment, Mr. Chairman. 
I got ahead of myself and I was asking the second panel. So I'm going to go to Director Sams uh, and I want to ask the director uh, about the National Park Service's efforts to dedicate a National Office of Native American Affairs and how this will help with opportunities to expand co-management and collaboration. I appreciate the reference to Redwood National Park, which interestingly uh, is co-managed between federal and state governments. What can we do to do more uh, with our tribal partners? Well, thank you, Congressman. Yes, we reestablished the tribal office within uh, my office. So uh, Dorothy Firecloud, who is uh, the associate director for that, reports directly to me, and she's building out her staff. And plus, we're ensuring that we have tribal liaisons within each of our regions so that we will have somebody who can help in that direct government-to-government -government relationship and consultation to ensure that we're not dropping anything as we go along. Uh, it's very exciting to have this reestablished. Uh, before I came to the National Park Service, I had worked, of course, in uh, conservation for nearly 30 years, and I'd done a number of projects in cooperation with the National Park Service. And um, sometimes there were tribal liaisons and sometimes there weren't. But when there were tribal liaisons, it really did help bridge any gaps. It was an opportunity for the federal government to not only meet its trust responsibilities, but to form long-term relationships that were transformational and less transactional. So I'm very happy to, that we have reestablished that here at NPS and Dorothy and her team uh, will be working very closely across the United States with a whole host of tribes and NPS staff to ensure our government government responsibilities are being met. I appreciate it. Thanks for your good work there. And I will uh, circle back with my other question uh, when we get to the other panel. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen yields. Let me uh, recognize Mr. Uh, Ultra, sir, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to my friend, Mr. Huffman, and his desire to move towards carbon-free energy. I'll share that with my grandkids and as an explanation of why they no longer live in a free and independent America. But in the meantime, I've got a question for uh, Mr. Baker. The tribes hold about 3% of the known oil and gas reserves in the U.S. Um, Mr. Baker, in your view, what's the proper role of the tribes in, in managing that in regard to the, the harvesting of oil and gas? I think first and foremost, it's self-determination. You know, we've, again, we've, uh, this goes way back in history from our past ancestors of how we got there when we had others that were doing all the drilling and everything on our reservation lands. And in the 80s, uh, the former Chairman Birch had moved that uh, until where we start taking over our own and we were in control of our own destiny. And so do you think that it's, it's proper to, to exercise the harvesting of, of more oil and gas on those lands? If, it's, uh, if there's opportunity, I believe so, because again, we keep talking about, we don't want uh, someone else's oil when we can produce it here in our own country, that we can uh, do cleaner energy. So I, I believe, yes, it's, it's very viable, but again, maintaining the, you know, the clean footprint of we have to do a better job, things have gotten better, and, um, you know, and it's up to each tribe how they move forward, each and every tribe. Okay, thank you, Mr. Baker. You'd also touched on the, the layout of some of these lands and the checkerboard nature of that. How does that checkerboarding of, of uh, federal, state, tribal, and private ownership land, how does that uh, impact uh, the tribe's use of, the, of that land? Um, the Southern Indian Reservation was once uh, 56 million acres covering the western half of Colorado, but after precious metals were discovered in the mountains, our reservation was substantially diminished. The tribe now does its best to preserve and protect the close to 700,000 acres within the reservation boundaries. After the Homestead Act of 19, 1862, our reservation was reduced once again and led the tribe's ne necessary work to collaboratively work with local jurisdictions in its effort to preserve and protect its resources. So we work uh, pretty well hand in hand. At times we do have a few hurdles, but we always seem to work through it. Whether it's the state, the federal, the BLM, whoever, we're always at the forefront of wanting to do the right thing for uh, you know for our country and our reservation first and foremost. Thank you for that, Mr. Baker. Let's, I'd like to shift over, if I may, to uh, Director Sams. And first of all, congratulations to you in your uh, 
uh, in your in your role with uh, National Park Service, Mr. Sams. Um, if uh, the National Park Service were to move forward with uh, tribal co-management uh, on one or more of our national parks, I know we, you, you touched on that. Uh, which ones would you propose as potential candidates? Are there any specific units that uh, could serve maybe as a pilot project for uh, for a co-management, a possible co-management uh, project? Well, thank you, Congressman. You know, there are a number of, of parks. You know, many of the lands that um, the National Parks has, particularly out west, uh, are lands that um, were ceded to the United States government through treaty, whether that was treaties of war or peace. But many times the tribes were able to reserve their rights to hunt, fish, and gather in those spaces. And they already do a lot of co-management along with the states and the federal government on flora and fauna. And so I think expanding some of those opportunities, uh, there's great opportunities at Yosemite, there's great opportunities at um, Glacier, great opportunities at Yellowstone, and of course, as we talked about in Acadia, where we're doing sweetgrass. There's a great opportunity here to be able to bring not only that traditional ecological knowledge, but the reciprocity that tribes demonstrate when they're doing restoration and co-management of these different foreign fauna. Because ultimately, it is for the entire American people. Our idea is to bring these species back, not to just a survival rate, but to a thriving rate, so that all people will be able to enjoy them for future generations. All right, Mr. Sams, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Yields. Let me uh, turn to my esteemed colleague from Arizona, Representative Gallego. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Lieutenant Governor, and thank you for your time today. I've been proud to work closely with the Bears Years Intertribal inter Coalition over the past few years to advocate for the reinstatement of the National Monument. And I was proud to stand alongside you as well as we watched the pre as we watched President Biden do that last year. While well, work to permanently protect Bears Ears Monument is not over, I am glad we are also discussing how to move forward and ensure that tribal voices continue to be centered in land, man in land management practices. To that end, I have a couple of questions for you. Number one, why is it important that Zuni tribe be allowed the opportunity to participate in the management of Bears Ears National Monument? And then two, what elements do you think need to be in place for a successful tribal and federal co-management plan for Bears Ears? Uh, thank you, Representative Gallego, for that, and uh, good to see you again. Um, as far as, and, and going back to um, part of the reason why we established a monument and a coalition, um, you know, we discussed this during our riot during the Bears Ears Prayer Run. Uh, the Bears Ears Prayer Run um, uh, was designated to allow tribal youth to reconnect to Bears Ears of the landscape. I'm on the and in that process, um, yeah. going back to my own personal journey, Bears Ears landscape and the ancestral ties that we have have allowed us to reconnect. And what I mean and I need for our younger generations to understand is that their existence is bigger than the reservation. When we speak to the things that we want for them and the continuance of traditional ecological knowledge, they are the ones that are going to continue it for us. We can want it for them as tribal leaders, but we can't force it down them. They have to want it for themselves. And if they don't want it for themselves, we see the spiritual reper repercussions they have. When the United States government first asked the Zuni people, um, what are your thoughts on suicide? We laughed at them because that was counter to our narratives, that was counter to our prayers and our stories. Now, if you ask us, what is, why do our children go down suicide? That is that, is that sense of disconnection from their own uh, sense of self. And it's reflected by a lot of the policies that uh, were adopted. Um, what was mentioned earlier about some of the extractive industries um, and, Right now, pitting kind of the, the idea of tribal lands, um, are they open for extraction? We're not trying to say that tribes shouldn't do that for their own people. At the time, um, tribal govern governments were being developed. The BI had very limited resources, and most of them were geared towards some sort of extractive industry that will allow them some sort of economic development. Um, we have not gone down that route, and we have found different avenues to be successful, and uh, pr we're proud to say that most of our funding, um, we're our own bank for a lot of our funding streams. So in that situation, we have found different ways to be successful, and it is through a reflection uh, of those values that we continue to hold today. So when we speak of co-management of such places like Bears Ears Landscape, it is essential because those are some of the watersheds that continue to feed places like the Little Colorado River, 
Colorado River in general, and those are some of the things that we continue to push for. Uh, we have we have heard acknowledgments from many representatives of that uh, the San Juan County themselves say that there is no extractive resources available for this region. So when we look at that, what is the inherent responsibility behind the federal government and the consultation process is that, and it usually comes back to the 106 process. And the 106 process, and what I mean by that is Section 106 of the NHPA process is that uh, we it recognizes that certain consultation has to happen when certain historic places are affected but it never reflects the spiritual, physical connection that we have to um, that place, um, because that is really, when we connect to that place, it inherently ties the ancestral past to the present and hopefully connect it for the future children. So those are some of the things that when we look at, those are some of the things that we hope to um, ensure that happens when we look at the, the protecting of sacred places. When it comes to co-management, what are some of the ways that we can accomplish that? Um, making sure that we help the agencies understand that we're approaching it from a cultural landscape type of perspective. When we're asked to, in the 106 process, we're, all, we're often asked to process it piecemeal, and that creates a hindrance to many tribes when this is one of their priorities. Knowledge of an area that has ancestral ties is important, and when we have that responsibility, we can't let that go. However, the government always treats it as, well, this is a project, here's this location, how is it affected? When we know that in our approach with the Bears Asia and Tribal Coalition has been really the 1.9 million acres. We understand that in the end, the proclamation states 1.36. However, we are still looking, that, looking at that as an entire landscape. So those are some of the things that when we're doing our land management planning process, that is what we in, hope will inform the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service how we, and how we can accomplish that. Speaking with the Forest Service and the BLM, they are experts in their processes. However, it's always absent from the tribal point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, let me now recognize uh, the Dean of the House of Representatives, uh, Representative Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the, having this hearing. Uh, I was really shocked when I say my good friend um, got the wrong panel. I, I know, Mr. Huffman, I, I knew we had a tough meeting yesterday, but uh, I'm sorry it took so much out of you. I have a tongue in cheek, by the way. But anyway, uh, I'm very interested in this co-management working together. Uh, of all due respects, in Alaska, the Park Service does not have a good reputation with Alaska Native tribes. Uh, there's a lack of participation. There should be more. And I, this is from Mr. Sams, you know, and in your written testimony, uh, you gave many examples how the Park Service is working with tribes. Um, I would like to make a suggestion. Just give me an example uh, where you're working with the Alaska Natives in, in, in the park lands. Hello. Thank you, Mr. Young. It is so good to see you again. And it was a pleasure working with you on the Kennewick Man several years ago. I appreciate your leadership. Um, you know, we are in, in deep discussions with a number of the Alaska Natives. We have a new uh, regional director uh, in Alaska now, and we're wanting to put a lot more effort uh, in that. As I said, we've worked with the Clinket in the past regarding the harvesting of eggs, uh, but we recognize there's much more opportunities to be working in Glacier Bay on interpretation and so we are reinvigorating our consultation and government to government throughout Alaska. Matter of fact, next week, I will be taking a full course on ANCSA and ANILCA. And then I look forward to getting out to Alaska to meet directly with several of the uh, corporations and the tribal villages to talk about how we can improve and greatly improve that government to government relationship we have with Native Alaskans. And well, I, I appreciate that. I, I, I'm not really upset with you. I just say overall, the Park Service has not done a good job. And you, you go, I, I do a lot of this work. And uh, to give you an example now, uh, we have a little project in Sitka, Alaska, 113 acres, uh, very little participation it had been now with, uh, with that park. And it's, all it is, is is a totem park. And it should be, I think should be totally managed by the local tribe. That's what, who it is, that's their culture. They know more about it than anybody else, uh, and yet they can't get a, any headway in the, in the presentation in the um, uh, 
what happens there culturally. And that's not right. And so I hope you take a good look at that and, and say, come on, guys, we can work this out. Uh, I have the land bridge up to no attack. That's another one. And no one wants to work together there. Uh, and, you know, I have n numerous parks that um, Anatovic Pass, uh, give you an example, with Park Service said, oh, we can't hire anybody. They don't have, they don't have any experience. They'll hire somebody from Massachusetts. We won't hire a local person. And don't do that. I mean, that makes everybody see parks and partners. That's what I want, parks and partners together. And you'll find out your job's going to be a whole lot easier if you have partners. And the partners should be those that have originally lived there prior to the creation of the parks. And let them have the, the opportunity for jobs and opportunity to present their point of view. You can do it with covenants. So I, I, just a suggestion. That's all I, I, uh, I and now I'll ask you, have you got a, can you give us something in writing what you think Congress can do to help you out or give you new tools to work with the, the Aboriginal people? Thank you, Congressman. You know, we are analyzing that right now. I've talked to the solicitor's office. I want to see how we're able to use the authorities that have already been granted to the secretary uh, and also to the National Park Service. But I think there are gaps, and I look forward to working with you and this committee as we move forward with some proposals on, on some great potentials of where you can help us fill, the, fill in those gaps so that we have some better authorities to work and co manage with tribes. I want to say, especially with Sitka and the land bridge, I've heard those concerns. I'm committed to investigating those, and I will report back to you on how we can better partner with both of those parts. I appreciate that, sir. And uh, if you do that, you can, like I say, I want allies, parks and partners. When you don't do the job I think you should be doing, or they you they think you should be doing, you, you're losing a partner, and that's not good. So we can work together to do the same thing the Park Service wants to do to preserve the area, but let the local people originally owned it, inhabited it, culturally used it, let them be the big conveyor manager of. So thank you for your time. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. You're right. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you so much for holding this hearing. Uh, you know, with five over 500 federally recognized tribes and hundreds of millions of acres of federal land that was once Aboriginal, you know, the tribes always exercised dominion over those lands and they knew how to nurture it to sustain their members. So the ability of them to bring their wisdom to bear uh, with the federal government and indeed with the state, I think is, is key. And I'm so glad we are holding this hearing. Um, with regard to the comments at the beginning that we are facing an energy crisis that should displace this hearing in any way, I note that oil and gas production is up. It's rising and approaching record numbers. The United States was a net exporter of petroleum and petroleum products the last two years. That's not the crisis. Um, instead, you know, we need to recognize that real energy security comes from transitioning away from our dependence on fossil fuels. So everything is not, everything's controlled here in the United States. I love the fact that this hearing is properly on co-management and indigenous wisdom in managing natural cultural resources. And I think some of our tribal leaders might say, this is a longstanding priority itself. This might be the crisis that we have failed to address it. Uh, when I was working with the Hikaria Apache Nation, you know, the state of New Mexico, a court said, state of New Mexico, you know, the nation is such a better steward of the forests, forests and their wildlife population. This has been proved for decades over and over again. Uh, Chairman Malvin, thank you so much for your wisdom sharing with us today how the Southern youths uh, are embracing the full range of energy resource development with a, a true respect for your lands and your self-determination. Um, Lieutenant Governor Borekadi, how wonderful to see you again. How wonderful to hear your wisdom, um, you know, which I was so lucky to hear um, when we were at Chaco. Um, I wanted to ask a bit about the co-management at Bears Ears. You noted that it's not just Sunni Pueblo, but a group of tribes in the th Southwest that are working on this as an intertribal coalition. I want to focus on that, that role that tribes can play 
working together um, uh, and with the federal government. Uh, can you tell us how you think that strengthened um, the ability to protect bear, bear's ears and their ability to advocate for bear's ears? Well, thank you, Representative, it's good to see you again. As far as the, the work between the Tribal Coalition, uh, again, when we looked at our proposal to then President Obama on the uh, creation of the Bears Ears National Monument, we did reflect on our core uh, cultural values. And it was that discussion and guidance, uh, again, being backed by traditional and cultural knowledge and within our own internal healing, we recognized the importance of this place and, and, um, the, and how to interact with the different agencies. Uh, again, we all had the same experience, uh, mostly walking down the Section 106 process and trying to advocate in general on the cultural landscape. However, we all came across the same issues and the same consistent barriers. So with that in mind, uh, that discussion with other cultural leaders and, and again with our own tribal leadership, um, that is what was inherent behind the proposal. Uh, based on that, we continue to have those discussions and they are reflective of each tribe's uh, capacities but each tribe has, a, has an equal vote and equal voice at the table. Um, through that process, it will reflect uh, their own. And, and again, the coalition is reflective of each tribal governing process. Um, each tribal government appoints or um, designates a representative to be on the Barriers in Tribal Coalition and now the Barriers Commission. And then again, that is with that inherent voice and that sovereign um, idea in mind, that is the handshake agreement that we have and will continue to enforce. So in that spirit, um, we can help the agencies interact with us better. And hopefully with that model, that is something we can be shared um, regionally across agencies and hopefully be adopted throughout the rest of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and if I could just ask a, a quick follow-up, um, what are, as, as, as the Zuni Preble works on this, what are the ways in which, once again, we can help you and the other tribes accomplish this goal of co-management and co-coordination? Uh, I guess we would really be supportive of some of the um, uh, memorandums of understanding that have come out. I know there's a joint secretarial M MOU between agencies. Those are uh, reflective of that and really appreciate uh, some of those efforts being made. And if those can be uh, reflected on the ground uh, with the field offices, that is where we can make that discussion and make sure that um, What's being spoken here is being reflected on the ground. That is how we can continue to reinforce that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, yield back, Mr. Chairman. General Lady Yields, let me uh, recognize uh, Representative Moore. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's, uh, appreciate everyone being here today. Uh, the topic, obviously, very important to to, to Utah. Uh, my home state and the state I represent and areas that I do. Uh, Mr. Mr. Melvin Baker, my first question, I'll jump right into questions. Like the Southern Ute tribe, the Ute Indian tribe in Utah cares deeply about its natural resources and energy interests. In the Uinta Basin, the Ute tribe produces more than 45,000 barrels of crude oil per day and 900 million cubic feet per day of natural gas. This is a, a major element of the, of the tribe's economy and a crucial aspect of the Uena Basin's larger economy. However, on pre President Biden's first day in office, he prohibited all new leasing on federal lands. This action harmed the tribe and all of America. Can you describe why this action done without consultation was harmful? Well, first and foremost, consultation is very important as we move forward. You know, we can learn from each other. We can talk about it. We can talk about the challenges. Um, the tribe has taken the lead in producing clean energy in Southwest Colorado, often filling the lead role in environmental protection. As we keep mentioning, we are caretakers of the land as native people. So we have to do all we can to protect the land and mother earth. In the absence of the significant presence, presence of EPA in the state of Colorado and Southwest Colorado, and proven air and water quality not only for the tribal membership, for, for all citizens of our Four Corners region. So again, we're always having to have discussions. Those, dis those discussions never stop. You know, we hit roadblocks, we work through it. We have to work with our partners and uh, other agencies, um, remove uh, some of the federal hurdles and shift to self-determination on our reservation. Excellent. Um, the, uh, the Ute Indian Tribe is also an equity partner on the Uenta Basin Railway Project. 
which will promote the entire region's economy by connecting energy sources with the larger rail network. However, this, this broadly supported effort is being opposed by several groups that have sought to delay the process. Why do you think it is damaging for outside groups to try and undermine self-determination? Well, it just seems like no matter what we do, there's always somebody to oppose it, whatever issue it is. Um, you know, again, I don't think they have all the facts and all the information they need to make a, a vital uh, assessment. But, you know, again, some groups just jump on the bandwagon and protect whatever without really knowing the facts of what's the positive of it. Um, tribal land is still considered federal and public land. So, again, we're going to do the right thing to move forward. Uh, even though we have that opposition, we still got to strive each and every day to try to get forward in what we believe in. Yeah, we've been, our office has been, you know, heavily involved in this. I've seen an enormous amount of thought and care for how this will impact uh, land, how this will, you know, this is area that these people live and work. It's the water, it's the, you know, the, no one cares more about these natural resources than those that live in the Uenta Basin, whether it be in the, on the, on with the Ute tribe or whether, it be in Utah, Uinta County generally, or Duchesne County as well. Um, I, I, I would make just one comment that the amount of thought that's gone into this project has been all encompassing. It's a 360 view on a lot, everything related to, you know, how it affects the environment to how it, how it affects the local area, the local economy. And that concept of self-determination is, is, is enormous. And I think that, you know, it's been a really neat thing to be a part of and hope and help bring the community together from uh, there's always there's been quite a bit of strife over over the years with with that region and that particular part of my district for them to come together on on this particular railway project has been has been um, has been excellent would you agree with that that there's been sincere thought that's gone into this in an all-encompassing way and has it brought the has it brought the community together to some degree yeah, I agree with it. But again, on our side, we're not really too familiar with the project that's going on up there. You know, and, and as you first mentioned, you know, how, you know, you have groups that are against it. But again, at the end of the day, you know, this erodes our self-determination as tribes of how we can move forward. With that opposition, we have it. And tribes have um, tribes should have the authority to determine what is best for their tribal lands. And that's for each and every tribe. We don't know what the resources are but they know, you know, uh, uh, years ago, how did they survive on the land that they were at? And as, you know, years have gone by, we certain tribes have been placed in certain areas, but native people have always been able to adapt to, you know, how to survive and do the right thing. Excellent, thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. Gentlemen, yields, uh, let me now uh, recognize uh, uh, Representative McCollum, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you for holding this first of a kind uh, hearing. We're here today to understand a path forward for the federal government to work in, in a serious partnership with tribal nations to manage their resources and our shared resources. And I just want to clear up a few things that got said earlier, uh, and I, it's taking time away from me, but I need to do it about some of the oil exploration. Um, the uh, Interior Appropriations Committee uh, worked diligently with tribes to make sure that they had access to the experts that they needed in order to do their um, decision-making process towards uh, moving forward with any uh, oil exploration or drilling for oil. It was really hard during the boom because uh, the federal government in and of itself, uh, keeping uh, even in, in the regular agency for having people available to do the work that needed to be done on federal lands, we're competing with uh, oil industry. So we got behind on that a little bit, but it was due to just sheer lack of manpower, person power. And then we were, were working with the tribes and how to enhance and work that up because the tribes had a right to participate on that. So it wasn't necessarily a lack of the federal government not wanting to uh, be, be helpful in this case, but it was a it was just a sheer number of having experts needed to, in order to do this this right and the tribes deserve to have any leases any any dr drilling anything that happens done in with all the due diligence that we give that we give uh, our our other federal lands 
We know Native Americans were uh, displaced from their homelands. Um, they lost their practices. They lost the ability to manage those lands and maintain healthy ecosystems. And um, you know th that that is a huge loss that we we also uh, experience as a nation. Um, tribal nations continue to fight to retain uh, their rights to hunt and fish and gather on much of the current federal land, and they have a stake. They have a huge stake in making sure that when the federal government moves forward on any land that we manage, that we support their rights, their tribal rights, rights to hunt and fish, gather rice, wild rice, get, uh, be able to uh, harvest walleye. And it means that those, those resources should not be depleted or polluted. So we have uh, a lot to do, and I'm very excited about this opportunity, how to expand tribal co-management. So I want to thank all the witnesses today. So Director Sams, I am so excited. Five years, five years it took for the Senate to confirm a leader uh, for the National Park Service, and I'm, I'm thrilled to have you doing in that position as the first tribal citizen to lead that agency. Your experience in tribal local government, I could go on and on. You bring a great needed understanding. So I want to ask you about how the Park Service is going to work under your direction to better utilize some of these existing authorities, such as a 638 a contracting, which includes tribal nations and the management of our national parks. You've been kind of queued up that a little bit on some specifics, with Sitka National Park being one of them. But can you kind of tell me how you're looking at, at the big picture? Because I know this is something that the Park Service has been trying to get right for a long time. Now's our opportunity to get it right. Thank you, Representative. I think really what it comes down is recognizing tribes as sovereigns and recognizing that they have that special geographical, historical, and cultural connections to park lands. And the tribes have the traditional ecological knowledge and practices regarding resource management that have been handed down through generations, as we've said before. What's important here is looking at that 638 contracting. I've been talking with Assistant Secretary Newland, um, DOI Solicitor's Office, about how we can uh, more effectively use the annual funding agreements, the AFAs, to be able to be able to support direct funding in those co-management and those co cooperative agreements. And I think that will help um, build capacity with tribes because that's the other, I think, missing link sometimes is being able to ensure that they have the funding necessary, the capacity necessary in order to be that partner uh, that can bring that traditional ecological knowledge, that can bring that years of practice and to bring their staff out onto the field uh, to help us figure out on how to better manage the flora and fauna. Thank you. I hear you loud and clear. So we as authorizers and appropriators have a job to do to make sure that tribes have the tools in their toolbox, both in authorization and in appropriations. Thank you for that. Mr. Chair, with your permission, I will be leaving uh, to attend the funeral of my colleague from Minnesota, Mr. Hagedorn. No disrespect to this wonderful hearing that you've put together, any of the people testifying or any of my colleagues. I'll be on as long as I can. Thank you. The gentle lady yields and, and thank you very much. Uh, let me recognize uh, Representative Obernault. Uh, you're recognized, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the fascinating hearing. Uh, Director Sams, let me add my voice to the congratulations uh, on uh, the new position and uh, certainly look forward to working closely with you. As you probably know, I represent two. Uh, of your institutions that we're very proud of, the Mojave National Preserve and the Joshua Tree National Park. And uh, my first question I'd like to ask is regards to those, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, we have substantial deferred maintenance issues in th those parks. The uh, Joshua Tree National Park is over $60 million of deferred maintenance and Mojave uh, almost $120 million. And unfortunately, in the first two rounds of funding under the Great American Outdoors Act, we haven't seen any money at all awarded to those particular institutions. So uh, first, I, I hope I can secure your commitment to work with us in getting uh, those that backlog of deferred maintenance needs addressed at those two parks. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, absolutely. Uh, my wife is actually from Palm Springs, and she loves the park there. So we we regularly go and visit, and I'm hoping to get out to Joshua Tree uh, in May to go and look at that deferred maintenance. I'm hoping to also get down to Death Valley and several others while I'm out west. But yes, I'm committed to working with you and your staff to figure out how we can 
get to this backlog of deferred maintenance so that people can continue to enjoy that park in so many ways. Great. Well, I'm very happy to hear that. I know my constituents will be also and certainly welcome you in May. And uh, if you uh, uh, if you didn't extend an invitation when you're going to be there, I'd love to join you out there and uh, we can we can show you all of the good work those parks are doing and the work that needs to be done. Uh, second question regards your new role, uh, you know, as a tribal member, I think you bring some valuable experience to the discussion with tribal code management. And I think this has been a fascinating hearing with respect to that. Uh, I want to talk about the fact that this landscape can often be complicated. We have tribal entities that are federal, federally recognized. We have tribal entities that are in the process of being federally recognized. And then we have entities that have not been federally recognized. So can you talk a little bit about how you navigate that landscape and whether or not the department has the authority to negotiate with tribes and, and enter into co-management with tribes that lack that federal recognition? Thank you, Congressman. You know, first and foremost, those that are constitutionally recognized uh, and through treaties, through executive orders, uh, you know, we have to make sure that we are consulting with them on a government to government basis. Those tribes that are state recognized or working through recognition, uh, we still want to work with them. And our, our, um, our secretary order uh, gives us some direction on being able to work with those tribes uh, in the stakeholder role. But of course, they also possess a lot of traditional ecological knowledge. And so we have an opportunity to work with a number of their elders and their practitioners on bringing that knowledge to the forefront. Uh, that being said, you know, we recognize that they have an obligation, that those tribes are gonna go through their process in order to get federal recognition. But that doesn't mean that we aren't going to have an opportunity to sit down and listen to their concerns also. Right, uh, it certainly seems like a reasonable approach. And then lastly, I'd like to talk a little bit about your philosophy on wildfire management in our national parks. Uh, I'm sure you'll hear from the park rangers when you visit Joshua Tree that sometimes the designation of wilderness areas can really interfere with our ability to do wildfire management, uh, prep, uh, particularly as respects fuels reduction, uh, you know, just because of some of the restrictions on using uh, even uh, powered hand tools in those locations. Do you think that we need kind of a, a, a third designation for uh, some of the lands that uh, preserves our ability to uh, to protect those lands from access, but at the same time allows us to use some more uh, tools and maybe mechanized access for the purpose of fuels reduction? You know, first and foremost, uh, I always like the term wild. Uh, what, that term in most Indian country, in Indian country is home uh, rather than the word wild. But that being said, you know, I started my career in trail building with the Forest Service and firefighting. My son currently is a wildland firefighter during the summer months. And so when I look at that and making sure we have those resources there, I think that the issue you're bringing up is one that we have to figure out how to tackle, how to do fuels reduction. Uh, I'm looking forward to working with the NPS staff. We are gearing up, of course, for a uh, fire season. I come from the West where we've seen massive fires over the last three years that have blackened our skies. And I do wish that Congress can work, and I look forward to working with Congress to figure out how we can have more tools in our tool chest to be able to combat this and prevent it before it happens. Uh, great. Well, we're uh, looking forward to working with you. Congratulations on the new role and uh, certainly let me know when you're going to be in the district because I'd love to uh, uh, accompany you and uh, uh, and uh, meet you personally. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Gentleman yields. Thank you. And let me recognize the uh, gentlelady from New Mexico, Representative Stansberry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's wonderful to be with you all this morning, and I'd like to take just a moment here to welcome our New Mexicans who are here today. Lieutenant Governor, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you for joining us. And also we have Kevin Washburn, uh, who's joining on the second panel. Um, it's always a good day to see New Mexicans on our panels. And I also want to add my congratulations to you, Director Sam. Um, Sam's, you know, I think that it's a new day in Washington and uh, your appointment to this role, your amazing expertise and service and your willingness to step up and play this role is so crucial, especially at this historical moment as conservation is really, I think, at a transition period. And we're really rethinking the way we think about public lands. We're thinking about conservation. We're thinking about co-creation of knowledge, co-management, and all of those things. And so your expertise that you bring is so crucial in that way. And I was listening to the testimony this morning and I was reflecting during the Obama administration, I worked at OMB and one of the rulemakings that 
that I had the opportunity to work on was removal of language from a national parks rule that actually made it illegal for indigenous people to collect plants and animals for cere ceremonial purposes in our national parks land. That was less than a decade and a half ago. If you think about, you know, in the historic trajectory of our country, I think many Americans would be shocked to know that there are still rules and regulations on our books across our federal agencies that do not recognize that our federal lands are indigenous lands and that actually prohibit activities that keep our native communities from using lands that they have used, managed, stewarded, and cared for, preyed on since time immemorial. And so the crucial work of decolonizing, repatriating, co-managing, and ensuring that we are creating collaborative ways to do all of this work is really particularly crucial, I think, right now, and especially in the context of our national parks. So I salute you, Mr. Director Sams, for your work and, and grateful that you're there. So to that end, you know, I'm a, one of the two representatives, um, uh, well, actually three, I think, that might be here today from New Mexico. And um, as we have heard and we know, New Mexico is home to 23 indigenous communities tribes and pueblos, and our tribes and pueblos have been here since time immemorial. Thousands of years have lived on, worked the lands, cared for the lands, preyed on the lands, and those lands are indigenous, and our, our landscapes tell the stories, and our federal lands include those landscapes. They're sacred places, they're places that are still used for ceremonial purposes. Likewise, our lands and waters are also sacred and the wildlife that traverses these different systems. And so ensuring that our tribes have not only a seat at the table, but that their knowledge, practices, and priorities are really at the center of that work is so critically important. And we already see that across New Mexico. Uh, we have Pueblos in the Middle Rio Grande that are um, heavily involved in the management of our Rio Grande and the water systems. Um, uh, many of our pueblos like Jemez and Cochiti and uh, Santo Domingo are doing important work yeah, around. Uh, hey, I got, I could barely get that out. I mean, are doing important co-management around a restoration of our national forests. Okay. And there's just a tremendous amount of um, important work happening um, with the Navajo Nation and our Apache Nations as well. So, you know, I would like to just ask Director Sams, as you have the 50,000 foot view of your work at the National Park Service and your collaboration with other federal agencies, what do you see as being sort of the critical next step to fostering this kind of co-management in terms of like I said, repatriating lands, um, making it possible for tribes to have a greater seat at the table, not just consultation, but actually helping to um, shape and inform the kind of management that's happening and the kinds of true partnerships and collaborations that are needed to, to realize this vision on the ground. Thank you, Representative. I think it, it, it summed up in one word, education. Um, as you alluded to, much of this has been missing from our history books and that understanding that tribes are sovereigns. So within the federal system, within our republic, you have the federal government, the state governments, and tribal governments. And those three sovereigns all have rights and responsibilities. And so being able to not only ensure that my workforce has that education and understanding of their trust responsibility, but working with my sister agencies and working with our partners out there so that they ensure when the tribes come there, they understand why they're at the table, why their voice is important, and the obligations we have as federal agencies to ensure that their voice is heard. Thank you, Director. And uh, I know I'm out of time here, uh, but I just want to make one comment, which is that myself and Representative Ledger Fernandez had the joy of uh, um, joining our Madam Secretary Holland at Chaco Canyon a few months ago. And I grew up in Farmington. I actually am not, not far from Chaco Canyon. And I was struck on that visit by the way in which the conversation has dramatically changed 
and how the voices of the Pueblo leadership that were there that day and the Diné leadership were not only a part of that celebration, but the stories of the people who lived in that landscape are now actually a part of the narrative, which for so long has been erased from our national parks and our public places. And so I think that in addition to the co-management, making sure that indigenous stories, voices, and, and the importance of those landscapes is all known made known to our indigenous communities is so crucial as well. So I really honor and salute your service. And again, thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for being here today. And, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for hosting this important hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the gentle lady yields. And uh, let me recognize uh, Representative Rosendale. You recognize, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking West, uh, Member Westerman for putting this hearing together today. Also, I'd like to thank all the witnesses for joining us and your testimony on these important issues. Montana is home to eight recognized tribes, so we certainly understand the importance of tribal co-management. I'd like to start with Mr. Baker. Uh, can you describe how co-management of the federal lands benefits both your community and the federal government? Well, I think if we have both uh, mutual interest on the land that we border and we have mutual, again, mutual interest, then we have to work together as partners to do the right thing. I think today is a new day. Everything we talk about, we have to do better for our country. We have to work better with each other. We have to be sponsoring each other and helping each other in a positive way, more or less in a negative way, uh, less barriers of how we can get things done. And we, a lot has been said today about that. And I think, yes, you know, we can work together um, in, a, in a positive way. Um, regular communication and consultation with federal partners, local and state governments, and private um, landowners helps provide consistency with resource management and development. So, again, we have the key is uh, communication. As an example, you know, these are uh, these cooperative and collaborative arrangements, the tribe has entered into memorandum of agreements with the federal, state, and local governments covering a variety of subject matters, including oil and gas management, road maintenance, law enforcement, social services, wildlife management, and air quality. So again, it's, you know, there's no time to stall. We have to really move forward and work collaboratively. If we have the same mindset, we can move mountains. We can get a lot done but rather than place barriers. And, you know, we have uh, shared uh, many goals, you know, we have a shared vision because we all want the right thing at the end of the day. Sure, I appreciate that. And, you know, the, the large landscapes that we're talking about, um, no, they, they don't recognize the boundaries, okay, the, uh, between the federal lands and, and the uh, tribal lands. And so when we start talking, having these discussions about the um, different resources that are located between those areas. Again, they, they go across those lines. When we start talking about the management, the range management of those areas, the waterways, um, the, the fires that many times cross those lines, that, that interaction is critically important. So let me ask you, how is uh, your relationship with the federal agencies at the Department of Interior, such as the BIA and the BLM? I think we have a great relationship with all entities. You know, at times we do have um, shortfalls, but I, it seems like at the end of the day, the big shortfalls are uh, lack of funding. You know, like if we had a wildfire, you know, we have the Forest Service, we have the BIA, we have our own tribal forestry, um, you know, so everybody collaborates in a good way. Um, the Southern New Indian Tribe prides itself on its intergovernmental relationships. The Southern New Indian Reservation is a perfect example of all hands on deck when a wildfire ignites. Due to the checkerboard status of our reservation, we share our community response with our federal partners, local municipalities, and private landowners. When a wildfire is reported, all local agencies respond. And as we move into the new technology in regard to, like, say, broadband, we're not doing it just for our reservation. We need that. We're doing it for our community, for the schools, everybody who can uh, take a part of that. You know, some may not know, even representatives from New Mexico. You know, we talk about our wildlife. We work with the Pueblos. We offer traditional hunts for some of the Pueblo tribes that come up and harvest off our reservation because they don't have maybe as much of those animals. So we work with that because at the end of the day, like we've always said for us, those are not our animals. It's mother nature's, but it is up to us to manage those animals correctly. 
air animals, as mentioned, they know no state lines, you know, again, but we have to protect each other. We work well with our sister tribes, the Hickory Apache tribe. And again, an example of uh, wildfires, you know, um, I think that the bad part is the lack of funding for our reservation roads, you know, and I, I, I being a former firefighter and being out in the mountains where our old growth is, I see that. And I keep telling my leadership, I'm like, if we don't fix them roads and there's a lightning strike, we're not going to get there. We have to. And sometimes we have to take on those responsibilities on our own with our own funding and our own resources to, uh, you know, fix culverts and do things. And that even goes for our elders who are out gathering the mountains, you know, uh, the local, uh, um, say, uh, Archuleta County law enforcement, if there's a shooting or a theft or something going on on our reservation lands, really without broadband, there's no communication. So we have to do our best to work together. And we have great working relationships. We meet with the state of Colorado uh, every two weeks with the lieutenant governor's office. Uh, we're meeting with the Archuleta County commissioners. We meet with our La Plata County commissioners. We meet with a lot of different local agencies that again, we're all striving for the same thing for better, better things in our, 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 our area. But we have Thank great you. working relationships. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your for your uh, input. And Mr. Chair, I see my time has expired. I would yield back. Thank you, sir. Gentleman yields. Uh, let me uh, recognize uh, Representative Soto. Recognize, sir. Thank you, Chairman, for the opportunity. Uh, we know we are in uh, tough times throughout the world with uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin viciously and unjustifiably attacking Ukraine. We have faced attack on our democracy abroad and Democrats and Republicans need to stand together. We trained and armed Ukrainians and this week I'm excited to vote on uh, a package of bills to help with military and humanitarian relief, uh, forwarding planes through NATO allies and a ban on Russian oil imports. Uh, that is relevant to this hearing, of course, as we're talking about all being concerned about rising gas prices as a result of the Ukrainian invasion. And there's over 9,000 unused leases representing uh, what the U.S. government has put out there. And harnessing those should be one of the priorities, uh, as well as President Biden releasing uh, an additional 30 uh, million barrels from the strategic reserves. Our tribes are a key part of this. We heard from so many uh, folks today about everything from uh, helping provide for the food supply to ecology to yes energy and uh, and so those relationships and that stewardship that our Native American tribes understand better than anybody as uh, Native Americans is a critical part of what we're talking about here today uh, honorable Chuck Sam's the third director uh, in your testimony, you mentioned legislation empowers the Seminole Tribe of Florida and the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida with customary rights and the right to refuse visitors to the Big Cypress National Reserve. This is a key part of, of Florida and of our local tribes in the Sunshine State. You also mentioned that uh, the, though the tribes have the authority to pursue co-management agreements, neither have expressed an interest in doing so yet. But how does the National Park uh, Service work with tribal governments to build their capacity to engage in co-management in places like the big uh, Cypress National Preserve. Well, thank you, Congressman. So two weeks ago, uh, we began that negotiation, that discussion. Uh, it was back in my very first government to government consultation. I uh, went directly and met with the tribal leadership to begin those discussions on how that's going to move forward. But more importantly for the staff is to provide them that training uh, so that they understand those obligations to do that consultation. Uh, you know, down at Big Cypress, uh, they already have um, the agreement that was provided through legislation to go ahead and harvest traditional foods and medicines. But they're also looking at ways to be um, interpreters within the park. Uh, they already have and um, provide some fan boats uh, for their own work there. But they are very excited about looking at how to expand that. And I think that in talking with my staff out in the field, they're also excited about the ideas and opportunities to really be able to engage in consultation to make sure that consultation is meaningful and hopefully end up then with those cooperative agreements so that there is that joint working together and also working together with those states who are involved so that we ensure that we're covering all of our bases in how we manage the foreign bond. President Biden had just announced a, a, a billion dollars to help fund on the federal level the restoration 
uh, of the Everglades as part of our SERP plan. It was the biggest investment from the federal level in the, in the Everglades in decades. Uh, how critical is it as we're going forward to help with water quality issues, with water supply, uh, to work with our local tribes like the Seminole Tribe and the Miccosukee Tribe? Thank you, Congressman. You know, I come from the West where water is also critically important, and I see how critically important it is to Southern Florida. The project and undertaking between the multiple partners, whether it's the tribes of the Seminole and the Kasuki, or whether it's the National Park Service or our partners at U.S. Fish and Wildlife in the state, I think this project is extremely critical to ensure that the flow of water returns back to its natural state, uh, heading out and south back out into the Keys and to off the southern tip of Florida, but also will increase the health uh, and the vitality of the ecosystem there, and it brings back ecosystem function into the system. Um, the work that the staff are doing down there truly amaze me. Uh, the cooperative agreements that they have from the multiple jurisdictions, including local municipalities and counties, is extremely impressive. Everyone seems to be moving forward with that goal, with that funding in mind, to ensure that water quality improves, that there is uh, sufficient water not only for human consumption, but also for multi-species use. Well, we're very excited about this in, important investment for Florida's environment, tourism, and, and particularly our water supply. And uh, we want to continue to stress working with our local tribes, among other uh, residents in the state. Uh, thank you, Director Sams. Appreciate it, and I yield back. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. Yields. Uh, I believe uh, Representative Stauber you're recognized. So thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member Rustman for holding uh, this hearing. Um, you know, I've heard a couple of my colleagues talk about uh, 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 leasing of wells. There, there's, there's leasing and actually permitting are two different things. And so uh, when we talk about permitting, uh, we must allow those, uh, those uh, folks that have the leases to be allowed to go through the permitting process. And we know that energy energy security is national security, and uh, um, it appears that uh, uh, the president has just uh, banned the the uh, uh, importing of uh, uh, Russian gas uh, um, moments ago. So that that's certainly a good start. Now we need to unleash uh, the economic energy that uh, we have in our country. Uh, again, energy security is national security. Uh, so, uh, Chairman Baker, thank you for joining us today. And first of all, uh, thank you for the work that you do to develop the resources you're blessed with in Utah. I, I saw the Utah tribe recently joined the Western States and Tribal Nations Natural Gas Initiative. Uh, to start, can you please share how access, uh, accessing your own resources benefits economic development for your tribe? Uh, yes, I think by um, developing our own, again, it leads to self-determination on what we can do. You know, we it's it's not a struggle. It is a struggle when we have to deal with uh, local agencies and governments as we move forward. But, you know, also for us, we have to work with our membership. Again, our tribal members are stewards of the land and they want to protect it. You know, we have an issue on our eastern side of the reservation where we know there's uh, resources available, but it's pristine area for wildlife and stuff. And so how do we balance that? Um, you know, when you have a, a, say a fence line that separates tribal lands from free land or, or private land, what we've had to learn is that if we do not make a decision to move forward and educate our membership along the way, other private um, companies can come in and drill next to us and take all the reserves out of our tribal lands. And that could be a loss of millions of dollars for our tribal uh, uh, community or tribal reservation. And again, education and health for our members is how we, how we when we are develop, developing and we're successful, that's where that self-determination comes in. We help our education, the education of our younger generation, as well as the health member, uh, health for our tribe. So those are vital things that keep us going and moving, uh, moving us forward. But again, we have to balance that out to, you know, do we give up the opportunity to get something or you know and again with the horizontal drilling that's a newer technology that we're really trying to educate our membership on um because it's just it's a it's a chess game all the time right yeah. or wrong but we always do the right thing and we only have one reservation so we got to protect it and do the best we can to preserve it when you those dollars that come in uh, as a result of of the uh, uh the oil and gas economic development can you just name uh, some of the 
um, things do you use those dollars for uh, uh, for on your tribal reservation? Okay, um, we have our own private tribal academy for our younger students, and we try to educate the emphasis is on our, our language. You know, we have our own health center here, which we always have to provide. Um, you know, we work well, as mentioned, with the community when COVID was um, a big thing. You know, our, our local clinic here opened it up to even Fort Lewis College and other schools in the area that are not affiliated with the tribe. But we did many things to do that. You know, we have a, a great uh, wildlife management resource. You know, all the wildlife we have on the reservation, we have to protect them. We have our own EPD department, environmental protection, whether it's air, water, all those things. Um, we have our own law enforcement, our justice and regulatory. So that's some of the ways that the money is used. We have a scholarship program that we put our students, uh, give them opportunity to go up to a college and, and fund them. Yeah, Chairman Baker, that's a, that's a really an impressive list uh, from, from education to healthcare, to law enforcement, to clean water. Uh, Wallace, well, so you're 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 doing well with that. Um, uh, one of the goals of the initiative uh, is to uh, help America export our energy. Right now, Russia is funding its atrocities abroad because the world is reliant on their oil. Uh, how can we help you and the initiative make it easier to develop and export our energy so we're no longer buying Russian energy or Saudi Arabia or Venezuelan energy for that matter? Well, I think again, the, the funding uh, is, a, is a big thing, uh, new technology as we move forward. You know, we are working on a, a Coyote Clean Energy Project uh, carbon capture, but now it's kind of like we're having to go backwards because of the oil, uh, the gas, you know, that we don't want to depend on foreign countries. Yeah. But, you know, working together, like I said, communicating, working together, having these big meetings and, you know, keeping in mind that, you know, again, we can uh, get many things done using our expertise. We have highly paid professionals, that, engineers and all those that work for us that help us develop that. And, you know, again, yeah. we got to make sure that they're doing the right thing in the right way and, you know, removing some of the red tape that does uh, um, uh, hamper us in certain areas. But again, we working together, talking together, we can overcome those hurdles. Thank you, Chairman Baker. Uh, Mr. Chair, my time's up and I yield back. Uh, let me recognize uh, Representative Gonzalez Colon. You're recognized for five minutes, gentlelady. Hearing uh, not. What are you on our side? Am I still on game? Uh, if, if not, let me. Uh, move down the list and uh, recognize the representative Bentz uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I just wanna begin by commenting on something that uh, Chair Huffman mentioned about how simple it would be for us to switch over to clean energy and ignore the need for natural gas and, and um, and oil, and I would just say this is uh, trading one dependency for another because clean energy, of course, requires aluminum, graphite, copper, lead. And if you a, a quick glance at the source of those of those minerals uh, reveals that China and Russia are supplying something over sixty percent of each of those necessary elements of clean energy. Not to mention the fact that it's going to take years. Uh, to get there. Uh, so I, in the short run, uh, we need the oil and gas that's available, whether it's on tribal lands or on federal lands, and we need it now. And, uh, and to suggest that somehow we should all rely on clean energy. It reminds me of this, this uh, young mother, single mother, I believe, who I saw at the service station in the middle of my district, who had $15 to buy gas. And I, I, that was about uh, three weeks ago. I can just imagine what she's doing now. Um, and so I just want to say, uh, let's focus our attention on, 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 on the reality that faces so many people and not make these allusions to how wonderful it would be if we suddenly had nothing but clean energy. I mean, sure, it'd be great, but I don't want to trade one dependency for another. With that, I'm going to turn to uh, Director Sams. And, and Director Sams, it's great to see a fellow Oregonian. Congratulations. Uh, first time I've got to see you in person since your appointment. I'm so happy that you have this job. But let me 
let me you know turn away from the congratulations and ask you a tough question and here it is the, the we often hear words like collaboration consultation coordination they're all they're all words that creep toward the fact that somebody's got to be in charge and usually it's the sovereign and i've heard much much said in today's hearing about sovereign sovereignty and it's all it's a very important but at some point somebody has to be able to make the decision if you have two sovereigns in the room it's kind of hard to know who's in charge and so my question to you is now that you're wearing the national national park service hat if tribes come in and they say hey we're equal to you who gets to decide thank you congressman it's great to see you and i do owe you a visit so i will come up to you and see you soon that being said, that it really does depend. So tribes have, of course, reserved rights under treaties and sometimes reserved rights under executive order. And so um, with over 576 tribes, that can be an issue that we have to tackle and we have to look at the legalities of that. But that being said, from a federal standpoint, you know, we ultimately have the responsibility of representing the interests of the American people. And we take that interest very seriously. Uh, but we also, though, still have the trust responsibility that we are mandated by those treaties that have been ratified by the Senate uh, to uphold those laws of the land also. Um, and so we recognize that treaties as ultimate, um, ultimate law of the land uh, may supersede some of our decision making. Uh, we also have to go back to the Organic Act and look at how we are interpreting and enforcing the Organic Act for the Park Service and also those organic acts that have actually set up specific parks uh, because those may negate and or lessen other uh, abilities for tribes at times to exercise their full authority. That being said, uh, that's why it's extremely important that we do have government to government consultation and that when we do have disagreements, we do our best to work through those disagreements. But there are times where we do recognize that those disagreements end up having to go before the courts for arbitration and decision. And but a challenge. Uh, a Congress, we get through much of that through uh, just mutual uh, work and mitigating for circumstances. Okay. And that's one of the reasons I'm so happy you have that job because you can see both sides of the issue. You also hold a master's of legal studies in indigenous people's law. And do you see, uh, given that kind of a background and all the years that you've worked in this space, a way to use the tribe's political power to get back into the woods and, and start removing uh, some of this massive buildup of fuel? And I'm not talking just about the, 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 the forests that are owned by by or controlled by tribes. I'm talking about our national forest. Do you see some opportunity there for tribes to play a part in getting past all the barriers that have been built up? You know, down south in Arizona, we have a tribal youth corps. We also have other tribal youth corps where we're doing cooperative meetings. Those tribal youth corps that are working with the National Park Service uh, and with cooperation through tribes really could be that ground force that we need to go in there and do some fuels reduction in cooperation with our other federal partners and agencies. And so, yes, I think the tribes uh, have the ability to help us start up these youth corps to be able to get in there and get some of this work done. There are other authorities under other uh, sections of law that are not necessarily with the National Park Service, but with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I won't speak to those directly, but I do know as a former tribal administrator that there are tools that tribes have that they could be using uh, to help reduce uh, fuel reduction so that we have less uh, large conflagrations. Thank you, Director Sams. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. And uh, let me now recognize uh, Representative Graves. You're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I've, I've heard a number of people say thank you for having this hearing. I, I disagree. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have a crisis going on right now. We have a crisis going on in Ukraine and Russia. We have a crisis going on right here in the United States. This committee has jurisdiction over our energy resources. This committee, we have the highest gasoline prices, the highest energy prices in American history right now. Mr. Chairman, I've offered amendments in this committee asking that we not carry out policies that have a disproportionate impact on Native American communities, on communities of color, on communities of, of low economic activity, Mr. Chairman, these are the people that are harmed most by what is happening. And what's worse about all of this, all of this is preventable. We've seen the president come out today and say that, oh, I'm supporting a Russian ban. Mr. Chairman, you know what's not said? Is that for the last three years, myself, 
Mr. Carl, Mr. Moore, Mr. Rosendale, and others on the committee have offered amendments to ensure America's energy security. We've done amendments to explicitly ban Russian oil from being, from, from being increased imports or increased reliance in the United States. Mr. Chairman, every single member on your side of the aisle opposed the amendments. And now all of a sudden, everybody's on board with a Russian ban? Now we do a Russian ban, we don't have a way to backfill the energy. So what's gonna happen? You think prices are high now? Just wait. We're getting ready to further penalize. Americans further penalize the US economy because energy has an impact on everything. It transcends everything. This is the committee that can actually design an energy solution. And we're not prioritizing our actions, not prioritizing this committee's jurisdiction. This is an embarrassment, Mr. Chairman. We have Americans all across the United States. Before this whole thing happened, one in every six Americans, one in every six Americans said they couldn't afford to fully pay their energy bills. One in every four Americans said they had to sacrifice some other primary need in order to cover energy costs. There's an article on the front page of my hometown paper today. A guy filled up his truck $105, and we have some of the cheapest gas in America at home. Mr. Chairman, the president came out and said that, he don't worry, he's going to release 30 million barrels from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We have 38 billion barrels of reserves across the United States, of, of proven reserves across the United States. Why don't we look at that and figure out which of that energy we can be producing? Why don't we figure out how to address whatever concerns are out there, legitimate or not, about the Keystone Pipeline? We can't just ban oil and think that all of a sudden it's going to solve problems. We don't have an energy strategy. And, and, and members on our side have tried and tried and tried to offer improvements, to offer amendments, to offer solutions. And all we've seen is policies that have resulted in, just like we predicted, everything that's happening right now are things that we predicted. Higher prices, less energy security, and Mr. Chairman, higher emissions, higher emissions. This is an embarrassment. We had achieved energy security, Mr. Chairman. This committee needs to exercise its jurisdiction, exercise its jurisdiction over America's natural resources, over the, the opportunities to produce American energy. And we can make up for the mistakes of our European allies as well. The strategy of the United States have been Schumer, Markey, and others asking that OPEC produce more energy. Jake Sullivan, the president's national security advisor, asking OPEC to produce more energy. Reports of us going to Saudi Arabia, negotiating an awful deal with Iran right now, going to Venezuela, administration officials going to Venezuela to ask them. That's our solution to ask. To, let's go through this again. Iran, what are they doing? They're using those dollars to challenge Israeli security in the Middle East to disrupt the, 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 the entire Middle Eastern region of this world, threatening the security of Israel. Look at what they're doing in Syria, what they're doing in Yemen, what they're doing in Iraq, and we're going to fund them more. Look at what Maduro is doing in Venezuela. We're going to give them more money. This doesn't make any sense. My friends in California, they'd say, hey, don't worry, we're going to close our nuclear power plant, then turn around and say, hey, can we release more emissions? I mean, all of these strategies are failing. They make no sense at all. Mr. Chairman, I just want to ask, we've got to use this committee's jurisdiction on true priorities and address this humanitarian crisis right now in the United States. Director Sams, for the record, I'd like for you to submit an explanation of what U.S. Fish, or excuse me, what the National Park Service is doing to consult on energy uh, opportunities adjacent to uh, Park Service boundaries. It's one of the things that that the Park Service does. What, what are you doing to help tribes exercise their own self determination as it relates to developing energy resources? Yield back, gentlemen. Yields, and uh, there is no further members that uh, have questions. Uh, so uh, I want to thank this panel. I appreciate it very much. And and, and uh, I'm not I'm not going to deal with the the debate that is occurring and needs to occur. Let me.
but let me just talk about what we were trying this this meeting. Uh, I support tribal sovereignty. The intent of these discussions is not about undercutting tribal sovereignty. In fact, uh, Chair Baker provided expertise to the committee to ensure that uh, in the past to ensure that any legislation considers just that. And and it did, and I appreciate the feedback and I appreciate his testimony today, but uh, as we go into the issue of 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 uh, tribal co-management on federal lands, uh, the full, full scope of federal responsibilities are also part of uh, of that discussion very much so. And uh, and I also uh, want to thank uh, the the director. And 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 my request is this: as as you examine how we promote this very valuable and important. So it's a resource issue. Uh, there's the uh, organizational culture that needs to change. And then there is uh, enhanced legislative authority or to clear, clarify some, uh, some issues. So on the legislative side, uh, it would be important to also for the committee to know your suggestions and your ideas on that as well. And to uh, to the to the witnesses, uh, thank you so much. We'll now transition to the next panel. Uh, members uh, may send you you will re you may receive questions and uh, uh, of members that were not able to ask, and they will uh, that will be forwarded to you. And we would appreciate your timely response. Uh, with that, thank you again, and let's. If we can transition um, to the other panel. Um, point of inquiry, Chair. Uh, this is, you know, acting ranking member Moore. Are you going to introduce the next panel? Uh, your video went off. Mine went off. Okay, there you go. You're back now. And uh, you will be ranking, sir. Correct. So who knows what's going to happen. We'll give it a, if you don't mind, we'll give it about two minutes, uh, the ranking member, and then we'll, we'll introduce and, and begin immediately with the next panel. Just two minutes. Thank you. Recess. Two minute recess.
we will uh, we will begin the second uh, panel and uh, again let me thank the witnesses for uh, the time that they're they're giving to this discussion uh, very much appreciated by all of us uh, it's the same uh, essentially the same uh, instructions that to the previous panel the you know your entire statements will be uh, part of the record you have five minutes for the oral presentation and the timer will alert you and orange leaves you about one minute and red but red always tells you it's over uh, after your testimony is complete uh, please mute yourself so that we don't have background noise on the other witnesses discussion and uh, with that let me begin the testimony uh, with Professor Kyle, Assistant History Professor at Northwest University. Professor, uh, thank you so much, and uh, you're invited to present your testimony. So, Goli Swagwego. Hello, everyone. Chairman Grijalva, Ranking Member Westerman, and members of the committee. Thank you for the invitation to testify uh, before this committee today. The topic of today's hearing is most of all about respect. And in the brief time that I have, I won't go into great detail about what you already know, that all of North America is indigenous homeland and that the United States acquired those ancestral lands through means that were at best morally questionable and at their worst were genocidal in either intent or effect. And rather than address how dispossession happened and explain how many treaties ratified by the Senate were broken, I would like to emphasize that these regrettable historical events are characterized by a disrespect for tribal governments. Take the United States' founding documents as an example. Although the U.S. Constitution implicitly acknowledges that tribes are self-governing, the earlier Declaration of Independence labels Native Americans as, quote, merciless Indian savages. Every indigenous nation at one time or another has learned of this duplicity. The Oneida people, for instance, were some of the United States' only Native American allies in the Revolutionary War, Yet even the promises of George Washington were not enough to secure our homelands in New York. The disrespect of indigenous peoples has extended and continues to extend to even our knowledge systems. And for this reason, the tribal co-management of federal lands would provide a meaningful way to reground government to government relations with respect. What we refer to as traditional ecological knowledge, TEK, is indigenous science and it should be respected as such. It brings a depth of place-based experience that non-Native Americans simply do not possess. It is this kind of science that led Indigenous peoples to explore the Pacific Ocean generations before Europeans, to selectively breed corn and create one of the most cultivated crops on Earth, and to engage in controlled burning of the landscape. The United States holds resources, uh, Indigenous resources in trust, and Adequately taking our knowledge into consideration is part of the Federal Indian Trust responsibility, first articulated in Cherokee Nation v. Georgia in 1831. And as outlined in Seminole Nation v. United States in 1942, the U.S., quote, has charged itself with moral obligations of the highest responsibility and trust, end quote, when exercising its power in regards to Indian affairs. That trust has been shattered numerous times before. Today's dialogue also belongs in a wider international context. In 2007, the United Nations adopted the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The United States initially voted against it in the UN General Assembly, but has lent its support to the Declaration since 2010. And this, le uh, this resolution is legally non-binding, but it nonetheless out outlines human rights norms in regards to Indigenous populations. The Declaration is the product of over two decades of negotiation, and it describes the Indigenous world as it should be. And I raise the UN Declaration to underscore that the matters before you extend beyond the United States' federal trust responsibility to its Indigenous treaty partners and intersects with international human rights law as well. And by having this dialogue, we are enacting the spirit of Article 18 of the UN Declaration. Quote, that Indigenous peoples have the right to participate in decision-making matters which would affect their rights, end quote. Moreover, the proposed development of tribal co-management intersects with Articles 8, 11, and 12 of the Declaration, to name just a few, in regards to providing redress for the dispossession of lands and the rights of Indigenous peoples to maintain and protect sites of religious, 
cultural, archaeological, and historical significance. The UN Declaration and the Federal Indian Trust responsibility are linked in that they both call for the highest level of moral obligation toward Indigenous peoples. And in my opinion, the tribal co-management of federal lands is an innovative means of sustaining productive nation-to-nation -nation relations rooted in principles of good faith and genuine respect. Tribal consultations alone do not constitute real decision-making authority. What's being proposed today is shared governance in the interest of good governance. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. And uh, let me now uh, turn to uh, our next our next uh, witness. Uh, hear from Ms. Asia Itoto. Uh, Executive Director of the Columbia River Inter Intertribal Fish Commission, Mr. Koto, you are uh, you're, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Grijalva, Ranking Member Moore, and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to recognize traditional ecological knowledge as a unique asset to tribal co-management of federal lands. Uh, I'm Asia Dakota. I'm the executive director of the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, which is the coordinating fisheries agency of the Yakima, Umatilla, Warm Springs, and Nez Perce tribes in the states of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Tribal cultures collectively hold thousands of years of observations, adaptations, and traditional knowledge of Tamudwit, which is our word for the original natural law that governs the balance of life on Earth. It is a spiritual philosophy rooted in a reciprocal and life-giving relationship between human beings and with the natural world around them. Understanding Tamunwit not only provides a sustainable relationship with nature, but also strengthens our bond to one another as a community. For all that was taken or lost, especially for Native Americans, our relationship to the land and water remains, and so our natural resources are our cultural and community resources. These teachings guide our land and resource management, not solely based on economics, politics, and science, though they are important, but through our cultural values, spiritual practices, responsibilities, and obligations as humans who live close to the land. For millennia, our tribes manage the rich and plentiful bounty in the Pacific Northwest, where 15 to 20 million salmon return to the Columbia River each year prior to contact. Between 6 and 11 million fish supported the ceremonial, subsistence, and economic needs of all tribes in the region, while still leaving plenty to enrich the ecosystem and replenish that abundance. Treaty signed in 1855 reserved our right to fish for salmon. However, a variety of impacts over the following century decimated these runs. By the 1970s, salmon runs had dwindled to less than a million fish and multiple stocks faced extinction. In 1977, our tribes united to collectively protect and restore salmon and their treaty rights to fish. They established the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission with fisheries management funds from the Bureau of Indian Affairs through 638 self-determination contracts. This funding was provided yearly with autonomy to use as we saw fit in creating our own modern day salmon management presence. Over the following 45 years, our technical capacity has reached the point where we now develop successful programs, including federal Columbia River power system mitigation projects and endangered species act recovery plans. Our holistic salmon restoration plan called Oikonishmiwakishwit combines multiple scientific fields and traditional ecological knowledge with a simple goal to put fish back in the rivers and restore the watersheds where fish live. The tribes just don't talk about salmon restoration. We are leading the way in innovative, successful programs that benefit all people in the Northwest. For example, in 1990, only 78 wild fall Chinook returned to Idaho. 25 years later, more than 71,000 returned thanks to the Nez Perce Tribes Fisheries Program. Collectively, our member tribes have a combined capacity on par with our fellow state and federal fisheries co-managers with tribal members representing a committed and reliable workforce motivated by culture and heritage. Our fisheries work employs over 700 people working throughout the 42.6 million acres of our reservations and ceded lands. This is over a quarter of the entire Columbia River Basin and 84% of the rivers and streams that are still accessible to salmon. We perform a majority of the on the ground projects funded by the Bonneville Power Administration's Fish and Wildlife Program and through the Pacific Coastal Salmon Recoveries Funds We've improved more than 5,400 miles of streams, reconnected over 2,000 acres of floodplains, and improved 15,000 acres of riparian vegetation. These projects are done in partnership with landowners, ranchers, local and state governments, and multiple federal agencies. Meaningful co-management entails both a seat at the table as well as the capacity to fulfill this responsibility. 
The federal funding we received facilitated our participation and many times created the form from which many of the recovery plans in the basin were initiated and allowed us to grow our tribal workforce. Acknowledging this, U.S. policy towards restoring tribal self-determination can be supported by welcoming tribes as co-managers of their respective lands and resources and providing them with non-competitive and recurring funding with a broad scope. In return, the federal government gains the benefit of the knowledge, commitment, and cultural connection of the tribes to better fulfill its trust responsibility and obligation to wisely steward these areas. Healthy, well-managed public lands benefit all Americans, both tribal and non-tribal alike, and the work itself brings stakeholders into a deeper community together. The tribes have a strong interest to help current landowners, whether they are private individuals or federal or state agencies, to maintain the health and productivity of our traditional homelands. Working together as partners, the federal government and tribes can successfully preserve, protect, and manage our lands, rivers, and resources for the benefit of our future generations. The benefits of this partnership are shared by all of us. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Let me now uh, invite uh, and recognize Dean Kevin Washburn. Uh, for William Haynes, Dean and law professor at the University of Iowa. Uh, Dean Washburn, you're welcome and you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Grijalva, and thank you, Ranking Member Moore and members of the committee, including old friends. My name is Kevin Washburn. And it's an honor to be back before this committee. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm impressed by what I've heard today. I hear many members on both sides of the aisle speaking positively about tribal co-management. I also hear the administration witness speaking about concrete actions being taken to pursue more co-management. I offer the following ideas to encourage tribal co-management of federal public land using existing legislative authority that might be need, need to be tweaked a little bit. I wanna talk about one tool for co-management um, that has not been fully utilized by the federal government. Chairman Baker of the Southern Ute Tribe began his testimony by talking about the lands that Southern Ute lost during the settlement era under the Brunot Agreement. He described 56 million acres that the Southern Ute lost and that their lands were reduced to only 700,000 acres today. A lot of our tribes can tell the same story as, as our historian on the panel, Doug Keel, um, explains. But um, the good news is Chairman Baker ended his testimony testimony by saying, by working together with the public land managers, we can accomplish a lot. Um, Gov Lieutenant Governor Boekety made a similar point. We should all be grateful, as I know the committee is, for his leadership with the Bears Ears National Monument. I come to my own views on these matters by looking at the kind of history that Southern Ute faced. When one looks at a map that showcases the loss of tribal land through the 19th and 20th centuries, and the development of federal public lands over this same time period, it's the same land. It's striking how much overlap there is in these lands. Um, all current federal lands are former tribal lands, and some of them were obtained fairly recently um, by the federal government, only the last 150 years. Tribes have consistently sought the return of their lands from the federal government, and there's a widespread movement today um, called the Land Back Movement, aimed at finding ways to address these injustices that happened in the past. Congress recently returned a significant Fish and Wildlife Service refuge, the National Bison Range, to the Confederated Salish, Salish and Kootenai Tribe in Montana, and there may be more opportunities for that kind of action. As our country continues to reckon with historical injustices and seeks to develop allies in much needed conservation efforts, more action is appropriate, and I'm going to talk about those opportunities today. Indeed, return of federal lands may be possible in some instances, but I encourage all of us to think about all the options on the table and not just return. One of those is tribal co-management. Tribes have had treaty hunting and fishing and other rights on some of these lands for, for, you know, for a very long time, and they care a lot about these lands, even if they aren't technically within reservations any longer. Um, let me note that tribal co-management can also protect tribal sacred sites for reasons stated in my longer paper on the subject. Broad opportunities for tribal co-management are already authorized by federal laws on tribal self-determination and self-governance. In 1975, Congress enacted Public Law 93-638, uh, the Indian Self-Determination Law. That allowed tribes to contract with certain federal agencies, primarily the BIA and the Indian Health Service, um, under 638 contracts so that tribes could take over federal services on Indian reservation. Indian reservations, and that has been exceedingly effective, very successful. 
1994, Congress amended that law, expanded uh, that contracting authority to allow tribal governments to contract with interior agencies such as Fish and Wildlife, BLM, and the National Park Service. In those 1994 amendments, uh, Congress authorized tribes to contract for virtually any federal program, service, or function at Interior, um, as long as it has a special geographic, historical, or cultural significance to a tribe that is already successfully involved in these self-determination programs. Similar authority was eventually extended to the Department of Agriculture, home to the U.S. Forest Service. The Department of the Interior is required by law to publish each year a list of ident to identify existing contracts and detail the list of programs that are el eligible for contracting. Since 1994, though, this list hasn't grown very much. Um, we, I think there's a lot of room for improvement there, and um, we need to see that list grow. I think it would be great um, in support of co-management. So I've got four suggested reforms. One is that Congress could expand Forest Service authority to match the authority that the interior agencies have. It's currently more narrow than that. Secondly, Congre Congress should authorize an appropriate contract support costs for tribes entering such contracts, or at least modest planning grants for tribes to explore this work. Third, Departments of Interior and Agriculture should take a fresh look at this program, hold tribal consultations, perhaps on a regional basis, and begin discussions to enter new contracts. Finally, um, let me note that co cooperation is hard, as this discussion says, um, but the departments, both departments, should incentivize federal land managers who engage in that kind of co cooperation. These are just some of the ideas of things that can be done. I am gra grateful that Chuck Sams and the National Parks is looking at more AFAs, and I thank you for bringing attention to the subject with this hearing. Thank you for that. I, this concludes my remarks. Thank you very much, Dean. and. Uh... The chair now wishes to recognize Mr. Uh, Cody DeShoto, DeShoto, uh, President, Intertribal Timber Council. Sir, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair Gerhalda and Ranking Member Moore. I'm Cody Dizatel. I'm the President of the Intertribal Timber Council and Natural Resource Director for the Confederated Tribes of the Cabo Reservation in Washington State. On behalf of the ITC and its more than 60 member tribes and organizations across the country, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss how tribes are well situated to help co-manage federal forest lands. In a total of 334 reservations in 36 states, it includes 18.6 million acres of forests and woodlands held in trust by the United States and managed for the benefit of Indians. Pursuant to both tribal direction and federal law, our forests must be sustainably managed. Tribes operate modern, innovative, and comprehensive natural resource programs premised on connectedness to the land, resources, and people. Our approach is holistic, sustaining a triple bottom line of economic, ecological, and cultural values. We care for the land through active management and do our utmost to aggressively treat problems proactively before they reach disastrous proportions fueling wildfires. Even with limited budgets, tribes have demonstrated more effective forest management than federal agencies. ITC believes we also have a stronger balance between resource protection and producing economic outputs that support our local communities. In addition to having more fire resilient forests, tribes also respond to fires more effectively. The average size of fires on BIA managed lands is three times smaller than on Forest Service. Suppression costs on a per acre basis are five times lower on BIA managed lands. Indian tribes are neighbors to federal forests, and many tribes retain and exercise treaty and reserved rights. Unhealthy federal forests impact tribes' ability to practice those reserved rights, and in some cases, those impacts overflow onto our reservations. Even with effective treatments to our own lands, severe wildfires from adjacent federal lands inflict significant damage and economic costs to tribal forests. In the last two decades, tribes have increased their co-management activities on federal forest lands utilizing tools authorized by Congress. The Tribal Forest Protection Act authorizes the Forest Service and BLM to enter into agreements with tribes for forest health projects on U.S. Forest Service and BLM lands that pose fire, forest health, or other threats to adjacent tribal trust forests. In 2018, the Farm Bill expanded 638 Self-Determination Contracting Authority to USDA for TFPA projects. This provided a funding mechanism to allow tribal participation in the planning and implementation process to ensure tribal goals and objectives are included. The ITC and Forest Service 
have been working collaboratively to implement this provision on the ground. The 2018 Farm Bill also authorized tribes to enter into cross-boundary forest health projects using the Good Neighbor Authority. However, the Farm Bill language failed to give tribes the ability to retain project revenues needed to build restoration program capacity internally. Legislation has been introduced in the House to remedy this situation, which the ITC supports. The Department of Interior's Reserve Treaty Rights Lands Program enables tribes to participate in collaborative projects with off-reservation, non-tribal landowners to enhance the health and resiliency of priority tribal natural resources at high risk to wildland fire. This addresses areas where federal agencies may not share tribal priorities or may agree but do not have the funds available to manage for them. A major barrier to tribal co-management activities is capacity. Management of tribal trust forests are funded at a fraction of the equivalent federal forests, 30 cents on the dollar compared to the Forest Service. In addition to the funding received from the BIA, it is restricted to management of tribal trust land. It is difficult for most tribes to justify using tribal funds on co-management initiatives off reservation when the tribal needs are so great at home. Tribes have been deprived of tools like GNA receipt retention, which could be used to build programs the states has successfully done for many years. The ITC recommends the following steps to increase tribal co-management opportunities on federal forest lands. Provide parity and project revenue spending authority to tribes interested in good neighbor authority projects. Authorize federal hazardous fuels dollars to be used to build tribal capacity for development of cross-boundary projects. Authorize the tribes to initiate cooperative forest landscape restoration projects where TFPA and GNA may not be an appropriate tool. Statutorily require that national forests and BLM adequately contemplate tribal interests in forest planning and processes under NEPA. The ITC stands ready to work with the committee and the administration on enhancing tribal participation in the management of federal forests. The ITC has and will continue to support legislation for both parties that increase the roles and responsibilities of Indian tribes in the management of federal forests for the good of all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And now let me, uh, recognize uh, the ranking member for any questions, uh, comments he, uh, he might have. Mr. Moyer, recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I do have several questions I'll direct to um, Mr. Mr. Dizatel, but I, I first just want to comment um, kind of what we've what we've seen discussed today. The and and I and I get it right. Um, the those of us in the minority, in the Republican side of the aisle, we want to talk about energy production and we want to talk about energy independence for particularly what's going on in the world. Uh, and there's frustration from the majority side saying that's not what today's hearings are about. I had a town hall last night, a telephone town hall uh, with my constituents in Utah. We had 71 questions submitted. 65 of these questions were about energy independence and Russia-Ukraine conflict and how the two are intertwined. So when we constantly bring up this topic. This is what our constituents are talking about. This that we represent them. This is the committee of jurisdiction over one of the most important things. And we should look at that as an opportunity. In my opinion, I serve on armed services and natural resources, and particularly as the ranking member on oversight and investigation. And candidly, I, I, I'm excited about that because I feel like there's an opportunity to do something. I mean, what 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 what's more relevant right now than armed services and and and, and natural resources and what what our nation can do to uh, to address this? So it's not an insincere sort of political ploy. Uh, I, I want to reemphasize one thing that uh, my 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 friend uh, from Louisiana, Garrett Graves, said was we're in a bind now because we can't we we, we can't prepare for this. We're gonna we're going to cut off oil energy or we're going to cut off energy from from Russia and we can't backfill it. And now we have to go to other dictators. That is an that is an irresponsible thing that we can do as lawmakers. Um, I, I, I emphasize that point. 
85, 90% of the questions that I had last night are directly related to this committee of jurisdiction. And thankfully, I've been able to, to highlight to my constituents that I've been speaking out against the secretarial order, the Keystone Pipeline since last February, 13 months ago. That's good for me politically, but I'm not looking for a political win. I'm sincerely looking for a win for our nation and for our allies. That's what I truly care about. And I know that's what all of us actually do care about. Um, and so th that's where it's coming from. It's not coming from cheap politics, I promise you. Um, I, and, and, and I'm gonna take this opportunity, Mr. Uh, Desitel, to, to just highlight, um, given the instability that we're witnessing in Eastern Europe, can you talk to us about the importance for us to look at dom domestic energy production from our tribes and even other communities and what benefits would you see from that? I look at it as an opportunity to avoid the, Ay the Ayatollah, to avoid Venezuela and look at what we have here and do it better, cleaner, and, and, and if we invest in ourselves, we can go find more renewable opportunities. A any thoughts there, sir? Yeah, thanks for the question. We don't have much experience with that as an intertribal timber council, but we have put significant effort into looking at renewable fuels, primarily biomass. And we know that through a number of studies from universities across the country, that that's primarily limited by economics, that it's fi not, not financially feasible to remove those products from the forests and make a profit. So you don't see it utilized on the ground. Now, I think we have had a lot of conversations about an avoided cost model, recognizing what wildfires cost us on an annual basis and how we can do work on the landscape in the near term to remove those fuels. Even if it has, is at a minor cost, the benefits that we see in the long term, I think hold huge potential. And most tribal governments exist in rural communities. So anytime there's an opportunity to generate an economy, that's helpful for local tribes. Let me put some numbers to that actually. What I have here is that the United States imported over $450 million worth of wood products from Russia. Um, wood, wood, wood products exports are a $12 billion economy for, for Vladimir Putin. Um, so similar to the conversations, if we talk at energy, do you think there's, a, there, there's an opportunity here to source our lumber from countries uh, from, 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 from leveraging our federal and tribal lands to produce more timber? Absolutely. That's primarily a limitation of funding for the BIA, that if you look at what the annual allowable harvest is for tribes across the country, we're only utilizing about half of that on any given year. So there's a significant amount of wood that would benefit both tribal and local economies if we had the funding to ensure that those forest products made it to market. Thank you. I appreciate you being here and a chance to talk about this. I hope my comments are, are understood in the intent that they are, is to be productive and to leverage this committee to the best possible use of taxpayer resources. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in any discussion going forward on, on the issue of energy independence, uh, self-reliance, uh, as a foreign, as both a domestic policy and a foreign policy. Uh, yeah, to that conversation, I think, I think my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, and, and, and I appreciate your comments, uh, Mr. Moore, I uh, have to understand that we're, that, uh, that, that those conversations need to be factual. Okay. And second of all, that those conversations are not one sided. Uh, that, that, Members on my side of, of the aisle in the majority have ideas on that pathway to energy independence, just as uh, some members on your side have ideas uh, to reinstate former policies as the, as the only means to, to acquire energy independence. I think that discussion is, is going to be important. It is important, but I think I hope there's some acknowledgement that uh, that uh, there's not just one one path to this and that uh, that whether it is the uh, McMorris Westerman piece of legislation uh, that is counterproductive to what every, everything this committee has been doing, if that is the template that you're using, yeah, then it is worth a debate because uh, there's some serious flaw questions about the effectiveness of that. But we'll, we'll get that at some other meeting. I wanna concentrate on this. Uh, let me now recognize uh, Chair Ledger Fernandez from New Mexico. Uh, you're recognized. 
Thank you, uh, Chair Grijalva, and, and thank you to the witnesses and this whole um, uh, discussion that we're having, the discussion we're having actually about the topic in, in terms of the, the roles and the importance of, of tribes actually participating and managing their own lands, which are also their Aboriginal lands, which also are in many cases their sacred lands. Um, you know, I worked for many years, uh, had the honor of working with Taos Pueblo, and we all know the history that Taos Pueblo was one of the very first tribes that was able to have returned to it, uh, Blue Lake, over 50 years ago. Uh, and, 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 you know, it was such a celebration for them to, re to receive back to them that incredibly sacred piece of land, which meant something to them that none of the rest of us can understand other than that it's their, it's their sacredness, it's their stories, it's their history, and they are therefore the per perfect people to protect it. But what I also know is that um, there was supposed to be an agreement and uh, for the wilderness surrounding it and funding uh, for the tribe to be able to exercise that protection because it does cost money, right? And uh, protecting a wilderness area, area requires the investment of resources and, and, and they have been frustrated time and time again about the fact that the allocation of resources hasn't come through. Um, and that brings me to your testimony, Mr. Washman, Washburn, uh, and how nice to see you again. I, I love the fact that we have all these uh, New Mexico connections on, on this hearing today. Um, but uh, uh, you had some good recommendations for tribal co-management, and one of them involved the issue of costs, right? And how important it is for tribes to be able to co uh, collect contract support costs and indirect costs when they exercise, execute a 638 contract. contract. Um, we know that happens with the BIA or IHS. Uh, it makes it possible for tribes to actually be able to afford to run that program. Um, but tell us a little bit more about what a better estimate of those indirect costs might be in the context of co-management um, of, of lands and why the failure to do that is such a barrier for tribes. Thank you for the wonderful question. Um, you know, the challenge here is tribes, you know, tribes are, um, they have limited resources. Many of them have limited resources. I will say there are some tribes that will do co-management even without contract support costs and without um, additional costs. But the fact is when the United States, um, you know, contracts with others to do work like universities, for example, for research, it often, recognizes that by giving them additional sums to help them pay for, you know, IT, information technology and human resources and those sorts of things. And tribes can um, can be more successful if they get the same kinds of resources. And when they do this, it saves the federal government money. Indeed, in some cases, and you heard some of it here from, um, from one of our witnesses, but tribes can be even more efficient than the federal government in providing these services. So that means the taxpayer may be getting more for its money if it contracts with tribes for some of these services. Um, in part, that's because, you know, tribes don't necessarily follow the general federal pay scale. Um, they don't necessarily have the same kinds of benefits and um, uh, that the federal government has um, and that sort of thing. So they can, they're a little more flexible, I think, than the federal government. So in, in some, tribes can, can do this um, sometimes cheaper, but they do need support. They need some of those administrative costs um, um, provided. So thank you for the wonderful question. And it really just makes sense, right? If uh, if the federal government would be doing it, they're paying somebody to do the IT, they're paying somebody to answer the phones there. All of those are simply the costs of doing uh, the business, right? And then there's this other piece that's really key in terms of the manner in which tribes will hire their own members to do this work. And, and the economic impact on um, the tribe itself and how they're able to grow their capacity. So that, you know, going back to Taos Pueblo, they have an amazing natural resources department um, that would that is available to do that, that is constrained by cost, but that then natural resources department is working on making sure that um, they're able to do some of the game hunts uh, and bring in additional resources. So. Uh, can you maybe touch basis on the fact that there is a, well, actually I'm out of time, <laughs> that there is actually this multiplier effect that happens when we are basically investing in tribal infrastructure 
and getting the benefits of that deep knowledge of the land that somebody coming from outside would never have. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Gentlelady yields. Let me uh, continue in a markedly New Mexico uh, vibe in this meeting. Uh, the gentlelady from New Mexico, Ms. Uh, Representative Harold, you're recognized. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It is, it's New Mexico Day in Washington. Um, I just really appreciate this hearing and I got the, I have the privilege of representing uh, Mascalero Apache tribe and other uh, Pueblos in, in the district that I represent. And last year, I actually took ranking member uh, Westerman down to uh, Ridoso, down to visit the uh, Mascalero Apache tribe so that he could really understand the difference in terms of forest management done on the tribal land versus on public land. Um, and I, I kind of want to kind of ask the same question my colleague just was asking, um, but kind of flip it a little bit. And I wanted to ask this to uh, Mr. Uh, DeSatel. In your testimony, you list out several proposals that Congress should be considering to empower tribes to better manage forests on their reservations. And if from in our area, they do already, the tribe, uh, the tribes and pueblos do such a much better job. So to flip it, um, what do you think the federal managers should be doing and what do you think they can learn from tribal land managers when it comes to preventing catastrophic wildfires and managing public lands? Thank you for the question. Uh the Intertribal Timber Council has hosted a number of different workshops to try to leverage the authorities that tribes have currently that have been granted by congressmen or Congress primarily over the last couple of decades. And TFPA has been the most successful of those so far. But I think when we develop those projects, tribes have tried to, one, utilize them along their borders. So you see what tribal management looks like on one side of the fence versus the Forest Service side, and then create a similar condition on the other side where you have resilience you have those tribal priorities included in project development and implementation. So it, in, in addition to that, you get the, the economic benefits, the ecosystem function benefits of having ecosystems that have been actively managed with a resilience and a climate change perspective in mind. And I think tribes carry that throughout the nation. That isn't something that's specific to the Southwest, but they do a great job down there. They really do. I mean, it is, and it's, you're exactly right. You can literally look at the fencing and look at one side of the fence versus the other and see a stark difference. And just quick, because I know we're almost out of time. I'm curious, um, can you give the committee any examples or are you familiar with any um, um, uh, steps that the tribal members and tribes are taking to address watershed health? Uh, and water supply issues. I mean, especially in these uh, rural communities throughout the Southwest where we're just riddled with drought conditions. I'm just curious if there's something that you're familiar with that they might be working on in terms of a watershed stability and in, in, in their forest management process. So I don't know of any specific projects, but I know in general, their management approach looks at what a resilient ecosystem is and the benefits that come from that. So we've got clean water, with good quantity, we've got clean air and all of the habitat and cultural resource needs that the tribes have. So their really guiding principles and management are focused on that. So although I don't know specific examples, I think there's probably plenty of them across the West where tribes recognize the benefit of those upper watersheds and why it's important to maintain those and not necessarily where the point of withdrawal is. Yeah, and I, I just think the limited number of uh, trees per acre would certainly have a huge impact on watershed downstream users, water availability, and, and I just hats off to how well, um, especially like Mascalero Apache and others have managed their properties and their land. It's amazing. So, um, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I turn back the New Mexico portion of your hearing to you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, no, I, 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 I happen to be fortunate, and, and uh, my spouse is from northern New Mexico, born and bred, and uh, we've been together quite a while. And I've learned that sometimes you just roll with the punches, you know? There's not much you can do <laughs> when it comes to New Mexico. Anyway, uh, 
Chairman Lowenthal, if uh, you're recognized for any comments or questions you may have, sir. Thank you. If not, let me skip down, uh, let me move down uh, to uh, Representative Garcia, if you are- No, available. I'm here. I'm here, Chairman Grahal. I was just here. Excuse me, Mr. Lontal. Uh, yeah, I, I just, you're recognized, Chairman. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. First, I want to thank you, the ranking member, for holding this on, uh, on uh, uh, the development of tribal co-management uh, on federal lands. And uh, I am not from New Mexico. I will state that. Clearly, as we, as we begin, but I have family in New Mexico, so I feel, and I've held a hearing, field hearing in New Mexico, so I'm very honored to be part of this New Mexico-focused hearing. Uh, my question, though, is for uh, Professor Washburn. Professor, I represent a coastal district, not in New Mexico, but I represent a coastal district in Southern California. Um, while this hearing is focused on expanding tribal co-management on federal lands, the focus has been on onshore federal lands. So, uh, is there any reason, uh, Professor, that we shouldn't also work to incorporate federally recognized tribes into the co-management of our ocean resources is that, as I think you know, I'll give you an example. Right? The Santa Inez Band of Chumash Indian is trying to do just that with the proposed Chumash Marine Sanctuary. What can this committee do to support the tribe's effort with NOAA? And what should we do to support co-management outside of Department of Interior and the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture held lands? Should Commerce and other departments issue secretarial orders similar to that issued by Interior and Agriculture? Professor Washburn. Thank you, Congressman Lowenthal. Those are such important efforts um, that cooperation around the fisheries um, in the, the in, in California off the coast. And so, I absolutely believe that co-management can also work offshore. I think that is exactly right. I'm not sure that um, NOAA and some other federal agencies have quite enough um, authority necessarily to be doing a lot of this, but there's good reasons to do so. So, um, so you heard a little bit about um, traditional ecological knowledge from my colleagues, and it's quite amazing what tribes bring to the table in management of fisheries. Um, you know, Native Alaskans, uh, you know, Alaska Natives can, can fairly accurately forecast a fish run based on the prevalence of mosquitoes in a given season, and they live there so they know. Um, and so, you know, there's those kinds of things that, you know, make sense when you think about it, but it's not the way that traditional Westerners approach um, um, you know, management of the resources, and they bring incredible wisdom like that. And so, I absolutely think it's important for tribes to be involved in offshore management as well. Thanks for raising that important point. Is there anybody, any other panelists that wants to uh, jump into uh, dealing with uh, uh, or expanding tribal co-management to offshore also? to our fisheries like the Santines Chumash Indians. Well, I, I also agree, concur that it's very important. And I thank uh, Professor Washburn and I yield back. Um, and, and, and thank you, Mr. Uh, Representative Lontal uh, for expanding the base. Us landlocked people, uh, <laughs> Sometimes uh, don't place the balance right, and I, I appreciate your comments, and they're well taken and necessary. Uh, let me recognize uh, Representative Rosendale, sir. You'll recognize for five minutes. Sir. Mr. Rosendale. Uh, 
If not, uh, let me turn to uh, Representative Garcia. You're recognized. Mr. Chair, I just signed on. Uh, can I pass for uh, the next opportunity, please? I'm ready. It's Rashida Tlaib from Michigan. Representative Tlaib, you're recognized. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I'm so eager to welcome this panel uh, and thank you so much for your leadership in holding this um, uh, important, uh, again, um, hearing. I'm humbled uh, by what we have learned from our Native Americans and traditional ecology-centered um, ecology knowledge. Um, Native Americans is timelines, uh, timeless ed connection to our lands that we inhibit today should help us really inform us on how we um, can have a more sustainable, more managed pres to preservation of our natural resources in our environment. I know here in Michigan, I am incredibly proud to stand with over 12 Native American tribes as they fight united against uh, the Line 5 oil pipeline owned by Enbridge. Uh, this company is responsible for one of the worst inland oil spills in American history. Line 5 is, for many uh, of our communities, uh, is a ticking time bomb threatening a huge catastrophic uh, impact on the environment, water, fish, wildlife of the Great Lakes and endangering tribal communities treaty rights. Uh, I was there serving in the Michigan legislature when that spill happened in, Cal in Kalamazoo and it was devastating and we're still trying to clean it up. It is disgusting that there is even a debate about whether dirty oil should flow through the waters that give us life in the Great Lakes region. Uh, but that's what happens when we allow corporate profits um, to matter more than environmental protection or our public health. So Professor Keel, can you talk about empowering Native Americans to use a traditional, I can never say that, ecological knowledge to, the, to help guide the stewardship of our land, air, and water, and you know, shift the priorities and values uh, of our federal, federal government? Can you talk a little bit about that? And also, uh, Professor, you know, would land management more closely align with traditional um, well, uh, you know, what would that look like when we align together those uh, traditional um, ecology centered knowledge? Thank you, uh, Representative Tully, for a really great question. There's a, a lot of you know, potential ways to, to speak to that. You know, I'll, I'll draw from my own community's uh, tradition, uh, the Haudenosaunee people, of the, uh, otherwise known as the Iroquois Confederacy. In terms of one of the ways, you know, how, how else could we you know, uh, approach these conversations? How else could we think about them alternatively? Um, you know, it, it's important to recognize uh, in Haudenosaunee intellectual tradition, we have a philosophy uh, that guides our decision making and has uh, since the formation of what we call the, the great law of peace, um, uh, which we refer to as the seven generations philosophy, uh, which is uh, a philosophy of long term sustainable planning, right? uh, as opposed to uh, gambling on, on, on short term futures. And that depth of planning. Uh, you know, is, is central to Haudenosaunee leadership. It's just one example, but it's a philosophy that reaches you know, other communities across North America as well. And then everything we're, we're uh, you know, all the decisions that we make uh, uh, in regards to our community are grounded in thinking about what is going to be in the best interests of the people for seven entire generations on. It's a really long time. Uh, it's not a brief period of time. It's, you know, it's approaching 200 years, right? And so for that scale of thought to be uh, how we approach these conversations. I think that's, you know, that's that's one important way uh, uh, to think about what it means to uh, to incorporate indigenous uh, 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 thought into these dialogues is, is to think about depth of time and different perspectives. That's a lot of what we're talking about with traditional ecological knowledge. This isn't about family histories that go back a few generations or even several generations, right? This is about thousands of years of history. Um, and to to really engage the depth of uh, of human experience, right, and 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 to pay adequate respect to it, um, I, I think that's you know that's a lot of uh, you know what these conversations are about. And you know, we are in uh, in a moment of crisis globally, uh, where our reliance on uh, on fossil fuels uh, uh, puts thank us all uh, in thank danger. You. Thank you. So thank you so much, Professor. You know, I think it's safe to say, you know, a minimum we need to implement real tribal coal management. Um, that's going to help us uh, fight some of the threats like Line Five. You know, most of the jobs, especially in my community from corporate polluters, they're temporary and they will be little, little use if, if another oil spill is allowed to destroy the source of our water and source of our life. So Ms. Uh, Takoto, uh, in your testimony, you give a great example of sam salmon restoration and you say it's more 
it's more than economics, politics, and science, it, it, that it's more than that, that you can talk about, you know, if you can talk about the Native American, again, ecological management incorporation, in, incorporating the cultural values and spiritual practices, how these values produce different resource management outcomes. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Um, I think I can rely really on our on our restoration plan, which I spoke a little bit about in my testimony regarding Waikanishmi with Kishwit. It's the only restoration plan in the entire Columbia River Basin that looks at the entire life cycle of the salmon. So we are looking at you know these out migrating fish as um, juveniles, but really where they where they're born as eggs, and now they go out to the ocean and come back to those same exact places where they were born to spawn. And then, um, of course, die and, and give the resources of their body back to and the nutrients back to the rivers and streams that they were born in. So I think that whole philosophy in terms of how we look at restoration and management is at a very uh, uh, watershed basin wide level because everything is so interconnected and we see that. And it's not, and then I, and of course, I come from a fisheries organization. Um, but we do concentrate on all of our foods, which we call first foods. And you know, traditionally, we have already always operated on a calendar year of when those foods are available. Um, so we have an innate knowledge of an experience and expertise that goes back multitudes of generations looking at these areas. So thank you. Sorry, Ms. Dakota, for not giving you enough time. Thank you, Chairman, for your patience. No, oh, thank you. Let me now recognize uh, Representative Rosendale. Sir, you're recognized for five minutes. If Mr. Rosendale is available, not, let me now uh, recognize uh, Representative Garcia for five minutes, sir. You're recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and the ranking member, and of course the witnesses uh, for joining us today. Uh, the federal government has a unique relationship with the tribal government. Our constitution recognizes tribes as sovereign nations. Yet today, the federal government still fails to honor tribal sovereignty and treaty rights. Today's witnesses have shared their experience on the importance of tribal co-management and what that looks like in tribal communities. By listening to indigenous communities on federal land management decisions, we can protect the livelihood and well-being of indigenous communities. I applaud the Department of Interior and the USDA for working to promote co-management uh, of public lands with tribes and ensuring that tribal governments are involved throughout the land management decision-making process. I look forward to seeing how the administration will put these principles into practice. A question for Professor uh, Washburn. Uh, what incentives or requirements might the Department of Interior provide to increase co-management engagements on the ground? Thank you, Congressman. One of the things we need is um, just better communication and cooperation. And we need it in, you know, we need it in the administration, we need it in Congress, we need it across our whole country, honestly. But one of the things we need to do is reward those tribal managers those park superintendents, those fish and wildlife uh, regional directors, those BLM state directors, reward them when they're having conversation with tribes. Like, let's encourage that. Let's put it in their performance evaluations. Let's reward them when they do it well. And that's just one simple thing that the administration can do to encourage this sort of thing. We also need more tribal consultations that, you know, the, the department these agencies should go out and consult with tribes, perhaps on a regional basis, to try to find more opportunities to do this sort of thing. And those are two things that are not terribly difficult, but can make a difference. Thanks for the wonderful question. Thank you, sir. Uh, a question for Ms. Aja Dikotu. Your testimony mentioned the commission entered into a self-determination contract with the Bureau of Indian Affairs to support the co-management of the Columbia River Basin. How did this contract assist you in your work in the Columbia River Basin? Thank you, Representative, for the question. Um, this, this contract of uh, self-determination of 638 funds really was foundational to the creation of the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. It not only recognized the sovereignties of each of our member tribes, 
um, acting individually, but also through our organization as an extension of kind of a policy and technical arm on behalf of the tribes. Uh, the contract provides the resources to develop policy, legal, scientific expertise to assist our tribal policymakers and leadership to make informed decisions that support co-management efforts and are consistent with uh, our tribal culture, our treaty rights, and of course, the knowledge that we have. It also provides the resources to establish law enforcement services um, that are so critical um, on the Columbia River and also allows tribes to enforce their own fishing regulations as part of our tribal sovereignty. Thank you. And, and how long did it uh, take you to put such a contract together? How long did you work on it? Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Representative. Um, the we uh, Critfic was formed in 1977 um, prior to me being born, and so I'm not really sure about the actual time it took to get that contract together. But I know that you know the reason we came together was because we were being denied access to the river to assert our treaty reserved fishing rights, and 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 we were being denied access by law enforcement. So by giving us this contract, creating our own police department at the at Critfic has uh, given us the ability to take back um, our control of over the fisheries management itself and the enforcement of fishing laws and regulations, as well as assert ourselves and, and any tribal members who do uh, get cited, go back into their own respective tribal government processes. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that's an example of uh, a win-win situation for all stakeholders and uh, justice uh, and self-determination prevail. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Representative Garcia. Uh, I think if I'm going to take this opportunity to ask, uh, recognize myself for some, some questions. Uh, professor, you know, in speaking of the importance of indigenous knowledge, this right following the European contact, the European colonists relied upon the indigen indigenous experiences, expertise, and support in navigating uh, this new environment. Can you talk a little bit about that? Certainly, I'd be happy to. Without being too bleak, uh, you know, it's it's fair to say that Europeans would not have survived on this continent without the assistance of traditional ecological knowledge of, of the knowledge of native people uh, provided in terms of uh, how to conduct agriculture and in, 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 uh, in American soils, uh, which was uh, unknown. Um, you know, uh, the innovations of three sisters agriculture, for instance, uh, which is uh, uh, growing of corn, beans and squash together in ways that complement one another that are, you know, uh, rich and sustainable for the soil, um, you know, are, uh, you know, uh, profoundly important practices, uh, you know, that come to uh, shape the lives and well-being of, uh, of Euro-Americans um, uh, after arrival. Um, you know, should note Oneida people during the Revolutionary War uh, uh, bringing our corn uh, to starving soldiers at, at Valley Forge, uh, one of uh, one of many moments when uh, when our traditional crops have, have come to save uh, Euro-Americans, uh, for sure. Yeah, you know, the the federal government's di diminishment of the historical uh, indigenous land bases across this country, how has that affected the, now that they, most of them are either federal or state land, but how does that affect the culturally relevant management of these lands in, uh, once they were, uh, they were diminished from the land base of the tribe? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, most of these lands remain outside of uh, indigenous control, right? One way to, to emphasize how important uh, it is to, to recognize that uh, that power imbalance, uh, one way to put it is that uh, for indigenous people, uh, the Holy Land is here, right? Our sacred sites are here, not across an ocean somewhere. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that's you know, an incredibly you know, uh, uh, important uh, framework for people to keep in mind, uh, you know, that we're talking about the management of other people's uh, sacred lands, um, you know, uh, and then and that's part of uh, the U.S. responsibility uh, is to uh, is to come and understand them as part of this uh, as part of this important work. Thank you. I, yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah. I've never understood that double standard, but that's me. Uh, Ms. Uh, DeCalto, what additional resources can? Well, better said. What advice would you share with a tribal government, a tribal organization, a federal land manager uh, seeking to 
establish a co-management relationship? What would be one central piece of advice? Thank you for the question, uh, Chair Grijalva. I would say, you know, similar to what I, I explained in my testimony is, you know, tribes have firsthand knowledge of current conditions um, and we've witnessed these changes over generations um, and our knowledge can be used to uh, further direct research. It could be used to flag problems and challenges, but furthermore, it's to come together as partners to come to solutions for the benefit of all of the resources and all of the people that depend on them. I think there are excellent examples out there in terms of how these partnerships have come together, um, even though it's taken a really long time potentially. Um, but I think um, I always point to the Yakima Integrated Plan as a bipartisan effort uh, for all interests uh, alike, looking for a uh, reliable quantity of water, clean water, and in-stream and out-of-stream uses alike. So I would suggest for that the, we don't need to reinvent the wheel in some cases. There are excellent examples out there. And really just to understand that our tribes know best about um, our lands and our waters and our resources that thrive within them. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dean, uh, Dean Washburn, I, uh, we heard the, uh, the professor address the, the history of tribes, including the issue central to this discussion, land dispossession. Uh, in your opinion, do you think tribal co-management is, is relevant in addressing the, the history the professor uh, discussed with us? And do you think uh, this co tribal co-management is viable concept for uh, land management agencies to consider? Absolutely, Chairman. You know, I've heard some criticism of, of, of you on this hearing for having this, this session right now when we need to be focused, some would say, on energy independence. And I see my time's up. May I briefly conclude? Oh, um, please. I, yeah. so, uh, but, but I'm, less, just... I'm the last one. I have a little bit of okay. flexibility in the time right now, unless my good friend, the ranking member, will I will indulge him with that. Benefits time. of being the chair, of course, you can continue. <laughs> Thank you, Ranking Member and Chair. Let me just say that tribal co-management is important to all of this stuff. I've heard, you know, people say that you should be focusing more on energy, energy independence. Um, well, let me just say that, yes, using more American natural resources is a way to get to American uh, energy independence, and tribes can, can help us all there. Another way, and frankly, the long-term way we need to get to energy independence is to use fewer fossil resources. We need to get to that place. And I think we all agree on that, that it's better not to be relying on all of these other countries for, for oil and gas. Um, and that's a conservation strategy, right? We need to use less and tribes can help us get there too. So whatever your goals are in American public policy, tribal co-management is helpful. Um, it's helpful to the people on the right side of the aisle and it's helpful to people on the left. So I think that's the one thing that I think you all agree on, even if you don't think this hearing should be happening right now, um, I think you have to realize that tribes can be good partners in helping you achieve your goals. And that's sort of the, the point that I would like to end on. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, the witnesses for their valuable testimony. Uh, in one of the testimonies that we're taught, the, the concept of time and the value and belief uh, and uh, that, that indigenous people put in the concept the concept being thinking beyond one, beyond oneself, that this will go on, and uh, I, uh, I think that's an important point to make in this to to, to close for me that uh, we have some work to do, some information, but I think conceptually, as as we, as we redefine, and as as tribes redefine for us, in the federal government, the debt. What, what trust responsibility means in this real world, not in that other real world, but in this time now, and how tribes are redefining uh, for themselves what their parameters about sovereignty are and should be, co-management is a tool. And we're, we're gonna be earnest in, in, in pursuing it. And I wanna thank all of you for the testimony, it was excellent and, uh, you know, it is a perfect time to have these discussions because uh, Chair, we have another know. member. We had a member join. Uh, Representative Rosendale did just join. Look, can I finish? 
<laughs> and uh, and I want to thank you uh, for that. And uh, with that, let me recapture the one point I wanted to make. That we're going to go forward with this, and it's not about an immediacy. We have an immediacy in front of us. It's a crisis of proportions. Uh, Ukraine and all the adjacent things that are occurring domestically and internationally on that issue. And we have to deal with it, no question about it, and, 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 and we will. Uh, this issue is something that has been put left in the past, and uh, its immediacy is for us to think beyond ourselves for a second, and that's the point of this area. Mr. Rosendale, you are, you're here, and uh, my courtesy is to recognize you, sir. You have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that, and I... Um... I appreciate you giving an opportunity to ask a couple of questions as I've been running two committees, as many of us do, at the same time. Um, last year's near record setting wildfire season demonstrated why it's so important to effectively manage our federal lands. All of us on this committee value our public lands, but in order to enjoy and conserve them, we need to allow common sense forest management, controlling highly flammable underbrush and vegetation. Neglecting to carry out common sense management harms our public lands in the long run, leading to catastrophic wildfires, devastation and destruction, and cascading effects that hurts everything from our waterways and our fisheries to just weed management that uh, ends up affecting other properties. Our tribal communities have a long history of managing our lands effectively to promote healthy forests. Um, Mr. DeSoto. Can you expand on how tribal partners can help mitigate wildfire risk and improve forest health through co-management agreements? Yes, and thank you for the question. So this is something we talk about quite a bit with federal agencies that there needs to first be a recognition that you can't take fire out of fire adapted ecosystems we have in the West. And really the focus should be changed on how we make landscapes resilient so that those post fire conditions are more in line with what would have happened historically. So when we look at co-management, it really means tribes need to have a seat at the table when the decisions are made so that we can ensure that those tribal priorities and those tribal perspectives are included in what that project development looks like. And again, based on the tribal examples we have across the country, we can build that resilience into the landscape. And there's example after example of fires that have occurred on reservations that have had much lower fire severity compared to fires that happen on adjacent federal lands. So again, I think there's great opportunity to share that knowledge, share that wisdom and experience with federal agencies, but the tribes have to have an active and really a prioritized decision-making process that they're included in. I appreciate that. And I think it goes back to something that we established early on in this committee and uh, and working with the tribes, and that is no decisions about us without us. It, it, it rings very true and it's very effective. There's a, uh, a forest research lab just outside of Missoula, Montana. It's called the Lubrecht uh, facility. And I would invite anyone on this committee to come up. I will arrange a, an appointment so that we could review that. And you will see the difference in the landscape where uh, the forest has been mechanically treated, it's had fire treatment, uh, it's had both, it's had none. And, and there are stark differences on the health of that forest. Um, while we're on questions, what is the impact of permitting requirements on the ability of tribal communities to engage in activities to improve forest health and mitigate wildfire risk? Is that question for me as well? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, with you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So on reservations, we have control of that permitting process and the NEPA documentation process. So that's not really a limitation on tribal land, but we're subject to line officers for whatever the respective federal agency is if we're doing that work off the reservation. So there are challenges with process. Again, those processes are largely dictated by whatever that agency's agenda is, and those typically don't align with what the tribal priorities are. So again, when we look at tribal co-management, we really need to have a, a seat at the table in the decision-making process and ensure that we, to the extent we can, work through those regulatory policies and procedures 
to ensure that what we're doing aligns with the forest management plan and that those forest management plans include the travel priorities up front. Very good. And Montana the Forest Service has set a sustainable yield amount uh, to harvest timber of about 140 million board feet a year. Unfortunately, because of litigation and uh, delays uh, caused by uh, environmental groups, they're only reaching about 40 million board feet a year. I mean, just dramatically less than that. In your opinion, how does that litigation affect forest management activities? Well, based on what we've seen in climate change, that if you're not actively managing ahead of the the disturbance event, primarily wildfire, the mother nature will do it for you and she likely won't do it at the scale you want and the outcomes probably won't be consistent with what you had planned. So I think it's important that we work through those regulatory processes and collaborate with other interest holders to ensure that there's support for those projects and we get them done before that fire hits. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I see my time has expired. I would yield back. Thank you again Thank you. For, for accommodating. Thank you, Mr. Roosevelt. If there's nobody else, uh, hearing no one uh, seeking recognition, uh, I want to thank the witnesses, thank the staff for uh, for putting together an excellent hearing, and uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.